All right, yeah, let's go through the assignments. Okay, so we had an assignment last time uh, to uh, draw a regular polygon. And regular polygon is a very specific term. Uh, this is a type of polygon. And a regular polygon uh, is essentially a polygon that has a, um, where the number of sides equal the number of vertices. So we have six sides on this one. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six vertices. Uh, and the angle of all of these vertices is the same. So there's uh, th these are all the same. And the lengths of these sides are also all the same. There we go. That's a regular polygon. There are many different like ways of doing regular polygons. So not only uh, can you set the number of points, uh, but the... Uh, you can also change what's usually called the density of a regular polygon. Um, so, so that's how you get things like the pentagram. Um, so the, uh, the idea of changing density is that instead of, instead of drawing a line from this point to this point, from this point to this point, uh, you kind of skip over a point. So you draw a line from this one to this one. So you get this line, and then this line, and this line, and then the same for these. And then you end up with a hexagram. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's a regular polygon. Um, hardest part for this assignment for me, n gone. Oh, like variable names. I I would just call it like side count or or just n. Okay, so that's a regular polygon. Now we know the definition of that. Um, and the the assignment was to make something that can draw a regular polygon. Okay, so the the first part of this was just drawing a regular polygon, ignoring density. Uh, so, so let's do that. I'm going to jump directly into Unity. So this is a very like code-based thing. There's not, not much more to it really, I think, to explain visually. Uh, well, actually there is. So, so the kind of the core of, of this assignment is to, um, to find the angle that we got for these, right? Uh, so we have an angle between each of these and the kind of the central thing is to figure out what is this angle uh, given n number of sides. Um, <clears throat> okay, so so that's something we need to know. And yeah, so what we then need to do is we take a full turn. So a full turn in this case, depending on what we measure with, if it's degree or radians. Um, in this case, I'm going to use radians because that makes everything more clean. Um, so a full turn in radians is 6.28 etc. Uh, but we usually just denote it with tau. So if we want to divide this up into six equal angles, uh, we divide a full turn by six, right? So tau over six would be the angle for one of these segments. Uh, but we want this to adapt to any number of, of sides. Uh, so for, for this one, we want the angle here. Uh, for this one, we want the angle here and so forth. So, so the way we do that is we take tau and we divide it by n, where n is the number of sides we have. All right, and then everything else is a matter of making a for loop that can then draw this, um, which let's, let's just do that. Shouldn't take long. Polygon, regular polygon, draw. As usual, uh, I'm just gonna stick to on draw gizmos because it's very easy to draw things in there. There we go. Um, and then we need to have have the number of sides, right? Um, so side count. Let's set it to four. Maybe we can make it a slider. Um, minimum three, maximum. Regular polygons kind of stop being interesting after like eight sides. Maybe 12 can be the maximum. Because uh, then they kind of start approaching circles, and it's just a, it's a low poly circle. Uh, okay, so in Android Gizmos, we need to uh, first figure out the, the vertex positions so that we can then draw lines between them. There, there are many ways we can do this. Either we can make a list of all of the vertices, and then we draw everything afterwards. Um, or we can like on the fly calculate everything while we're drawing it. Um, I usually like to separate the drawing from all of the calculations. So in that case, it makes sense to, to make a, uh, an array of all of the uh, coordinates that we want to generate. Uh, let's call it verts for the vertices. And let's make that a new 
vector two array with side count number of uh, entries. Because the number of sides equal the number of vertices. So for starters, um, we need to generate these vertices. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think it was really fascinating how it closes into a circle. Yeah, um, it's kind of how it goes. Uh, but something that is very interesting to me is that it is actually kind of debatable whether or not when you have infinite numbers of points, you get a circle. Um, kind of technically, uh, there are some interpretations where that wouldn't be the case. So, so if you think about the angle we get here, uh, actually, let's look at it from a different perspective. So look, let's look at the angle uh, instead of uh, angle from the center to two vertices. Let's look at the angle between here. This is a bit of an aside, but I think it's interesting. Uh, so this angle, what is this? It's like 60 degrees or something. Uh, so that's 60 degrees. Okay, let's look at, at the next one. That's 90 degrees. Let's look at the next one. Uh, this one is, heck, I forget, 120, something like that. I think it's 120 degrees. Uh, so you can see that this angle is increasing the more points we have, right? Uh, and this one is, uh, I don't know, but it's bigger than 120. <laughs> uh, I'm bad at doing maths in my head. So if you consider this case, as you increase the number of points, if you go to infinity, this angle we, will be 180 degrees. So is that really a polygon? Because technically it can't really close in on itself once you reach infinity numbers of points. Uh, so it's kind of like um, debatable whether or not that is a circle uh, once you go to like infinity. Um, anyway, I just think that's kind of interesting. <laughs> also, that's called an aperogon, by the way. Um, but yes, a regular polygon with an infinite number of points. Uh, okay, all right. So we got verts. Let's define all the verts. So we need to make a for loop because we need to um, define each of these and we need to iterate through this uh, side count number of times. Okay, so verts i, right. Okay, so now we need to figure out what angle do we need to assign to each of these. Um, and we have talked before about uh, functions that can kind of uh, convert an angle to a coordinate and that's gonna be really useful here. So we had these functions before. Um, the angle to direction and direction to angle. Uh, so I'm gonna, generally you would have this in a math class, but I'm just gonna copy this around because why not? All right, so now we have our functions that we talked about before. We have our circle constants and we can now easily like give this an angle and then we get a direction out of it, which can also be used as a coordinate. Okay, so all we need to do now is we need to do this angle to direction and then we need to pass an angle value into this one. And for each iteration, we need to increase by this blue angle right here, the angle between two vertices. Uh, which we talked about before uh, is tau over n, where n is the number of vertices or the number of sides, same thing. Yeah, so we do tau over n and, uh, right, sorry, uh, tau over side count. And then we multiply this by what vertex we're on. Uh, because as soon as we go to uh, the next one, um, we want the angle going from here to here, right? Uh, so then we want we want it to be twice as big. And then for the next one, we want it to be three times as big and so forth. So that's the angle that we're calculating now. Uh, so then we want I multiplied by the angle between uh, each vertex. Um, and if you want, you could pre-calculate this. If you want like a more explicit thing that says this is the angle between the vertices, kind of depends on your coding style. All right, so now we should have these vertices. Uh, and one good thing to do is to always like debug and visualize to make sure that everything works. Um, so, so let's make another for loop. Uh, so again, I want to separate the generation of data versus drawing. So that's why I have separate for loops. Um, okay, gizmos dot draw sphere. And we want to draw this at each of these points. So uh, verts i with some, some radius. Let's make them red as well. I don't know where we are, if we're in 2D or 3D, we need to center ourselves. There we go. We have four red dots. Neat. Um, we should make this one serialized so that we can edit it. All right, so we have our side count and we can now increase this one or decrease it. And this looks like it works. If it's set to three, we have three points, four, four points, five, five points, and so forth. 
Uh, neat. So that works. Now we just need to draw lines. Okay. Let's do the lines. So gizmos dot draw line. Now we want, uh, from the current index, we want to draw it to the next index. Uh, so to go to the next in index, we do I plus one. Uh, I plus one. Uh, but if we just do this, uh, we're going to get an index out of range exception because this can be outside of the array. Uh, once we reach the last vertex, uh, this is going to be outside. Uh, so we need to make sure that this one wraps around so that when we get a value that is exactly equal to the number of side count, it's going to go back to zero and so forth. Um, so we can use the modulo operator for that. So we want to do this modulo side count. All right, uh, we haven't talked about modulo, but I presume you've done array wrapping stuff before, I hope. There we go. Now we have some lines. Um, so we can increase the side count and we now get a regular polygon. Not specifically array wrapping actually. Oh, okay. Um, essentially, if you have an array of doot, 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 there we go. Actually zero index, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's say you have an array. These are all the elements you have in the array. Um, if you want to know, if you, when we're iterating through an array, we have the, the value i, and that is assigned to each of these. So when we're iterating in a for loop, we're getting this one, and then this one, and then this one, and then this one. When we want to know the next index, uh, if we do um, i plus one, uh, then what's going to happen is that uh, we're going to point to Sorry, this is very low resolution. I apologize. So we're going to point to these. So for the first iteration, we're fine. For the second iteration, we're also fine. We're returning indices that actually exist in this array. Third iteration, we're also fine. But the next time, uh, we're going to get an index out of range because element number four doesn't exist. Um, so to solve that, uh, you can use the modulo operator, uh, which uh, we want to do this modulo uh, four in this case, because that's the full length of this one. Um, what that means is that if we go above the value of three, or rather four or above, uh, we're going to wrap this around to be within this range. Yeah, so what's going to happen is that once we go to number four or above, this one is going to wrap around and point to this one, uh, kind of automatically. Uh, and that still works for values uh, below this one. So it's still going to be fine here. It's not going to... Oops. Uh, it's still going to work here. It's not going to wrap around here because uh, modulo 4, if you have a value between uh, 0 and 3, modulo 4 is not going to do anything because then we're already in the correct range. Uh, so once we hit here, it's going to wrap around. Um, there are a bunch of caveats for how modulo works. Uh, modulo has strange behavior for negative numbers. Um, so if you want to do something like getting the previous point, uh, using the modulo um, is, isn't enough. Um, you need to make sure that you have a, a, a modulo function that can handle negative numbers properly, um, because modulo in programming is garbage and useless. Um, so usually, you would have to use some sort of math library that has a properly implemented modulo function. <clears throat> if you want to handle negative numbers. Um, there are a few hacks you can do to make it work, like in some cases. Uh, if you do i plus 1 uh, plus the length, which in this case is 4, now you can handle some of the negative numbers, but not all of them. <laughs> you can go sort of negative um, at the same length as the array. This can sometimes be an acceptable hack if you know that you never have, um, if you know that you never have like four negative numbers that go like beyond negative 4. Um, <clears throat> Uh, anyway, um, okay, so that's what mo that's what modulo is. Very useful thing. Okay, I'm pretty sure I have that modulo in my math library. Okay, yeah, I have that value in, or I have that modulo operator in my math library. If you wanna, if you wanna check that out, I linked it so many times at this point. Uh, but yeah, you should use my math library. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, it's called mod in that one, and that one handles negative numbers. So that one you don't need to, uh, that one you don't need to care about that. Anyway, that's what modulo is. So what modulo helps us do is we can skip ahead uh, without any issues. Um, so that was the first part of the assignments. The second part was to allow you to set a density. So all that kind of does is that you can set the number of points that you want to skip ahead with every time you draw a line. So both of these have five sides and five vertices, and both of them are regular polygons. Um, 
but they skip over a different number of points in order to reach the next vertex. If we go to uh, the code, we need to have a density value. Let's set it at one. Range one, two, four or something, I guess. It should allow any numbers if you want to be like mathematical about it, but. All right, so now we have a density. Um, then all we need to do is when we draw the line here, uh, here we skipped one point ahead, right? But now the number of points we want to skip ahead is the density value. So now if we go back here and set density to two, um, we now have a, a heptagon that is stellated. It's a, it's a star heptagon. And we can change this to a uh, pentagram and a hexagram, heptagram, octagram, and so forth. This is one of my favorites. This one is neat. Any questions about the regular polygon assignments? Hope you don't summon Satan now. Oh no. Also, as a side note, <clears throat> what I think is kind of funny is that when you set uh, side count to 6, density to 2. Now we have the hexagram, right? But what I think is kind of interesting is that this is not actually a regular polygon because this doesn't fall under the definition of a polygon. Um, I think that's kind of kind of interesting um, because a, a polygon has to be connected, uh, like a connected chain of vertices. This one is not a connected chain of vertices, right? This one is two separate polygons. It's two um, it's two triangles stuck together, um, which is kind of interesting. So, like, technically, this is actually not a regular polygon under the under the like strict definition of polygon. Yeah. So this is actually a compound uh, star shape rather than a polygon. Is it fair to say polygons have four sides? Well, that is more three sided triangulars. No, that has nothing to do with that. The only definition, the only strict thing about polygons is that it has to be a single connected chain of vertices that form a loop. Uh, and that doesn't happen for the first uh, or the second density of the, the, the octa octagram, for instance. If you go to the octagram and then this one, this one is just two squares. This is not a single chain of connected vertices. Um, but if you go to the heptagram, this is a single chain of connected vertices. Uh, this is a polygon, like a true polygon. Um, but the other ones are just compound shapes where we have two overlapping polygons. So the next one was you had a camera. We were simplifying it a lot. Uh, just, a, just a single camera uh, that's just, uh, you, we can ignore rotation and everything. Uh, but the goal was to make the field of view of the camera adapt to a set of objects. Um, so that was the goal. That was 8A. Uh, we should have any number of points and the field of view should make sure that we fit all of these points. Uh, this is something we talked about last stream. So the uh, kind of the, the core thing you need to do here is to figure out the angles to these. Um, so th there are kind of like two steps to this. The uh, when we did this on stream, we kind of presumed there was only one point, but in this case, in the assignment, you need to take care of all of these points. Um, so there are kind of two steps to this. We need to find what vertex is the outermost vertex, or not vertex, sorry, what point is the outermost point. Um, there are many ways we can do this. Um, either we can uh, calculate the angle to each of these points, um, like we can check all of these angles and then we we assign the field of view to whatever is the biggest of these angles. Um, although that is likely more expensive than first figuring out which ones are the furthest away and then calculating the angle. So it kind of depends on how optimized we want this to be. Yeah, uh, which one do we do? Do we do the optimized one or the, uh, or the brute force uh, simple naive one? Um, oh, we have a field of view script. I'm gonna delete that, that's spoilers. All right, let's see, we have all the objects there. Okay, uh, we need the set of points. So public transform array points. And then uh, we need the camera. So camera C equals, uh, sorry, cam. Get component, camera, just boilerplate, setting everything up. Uh, we need to assign the points. Uh, 
Boop. There we go. Okay. We have a bunch of points. Um, so, uh, I'm just going to draw a line from uh, this position to each point. Um, excuse me? There we go. Okay. Is this under the assumption that the camera always faces a pre predefinite cardinal direction? Yes. Currently, yes. This this time it's only facing to the right, but a later part of the assignment is about handling any rotation. Um, but right now we're doing this one. All right. So now we have a reference to all of these points, um, but you can see that the field of view is now going outside of what we need. Uh, in this case, we want to shrink the field of view. In this case, we want to grow it to fit all the points. So now we want to find the uh, outermost point. Uh, what point would give us the highest field of view versus lowest field of view? There are like many ways of doing this, but we talked about that, uh, that we want to do the, the optimized version. So again, the goal is to find which one is the furthest out. Okay, so what we can do is that, uh, let's see, we don't want to draw all of these points. What we can do is that we can use the dot product for this, right? We can use a dot product to figure out, because um, we, we have the direction of the camera and we have the direction to each of these vertices. So if we do the dot product here, um, if it's directly in front, then the dot product is going to be one. Uh, if it starts deviating, the dot product is going to get smaller and smaller. If it's completely perpendicular, the dot product is zero. Um, so what we get here is that we actually have a value for how much it's pointing away from the camera, right? So if we do use this method, uh, then we can kind of just do the dot product and find the the one that has the uh, lowest value in terms of the dot product, right? Um, so so then we do the dot product against each of these points, find the lowest one, and then that's our outermost points. Uh, so so let's try that. Okay, so we need the direction of the camera, so. Uh, let's see, we are in the x, y plane, right? Uh, yes. Okay, so we can use 2D vectors. So camera direction is camera dot transform dot forward. And then we want the direction to each of these points, but we're going to do that for, for all of these. Um, so we can do uh, a for each. Uh, we could also do this using a link query, which is kind of neat. Um, so actually, it's sort of. Kind of not, maybe, um, because we need the index rather than the lowest value. Uh, anyway, uh, so we want to iterate through all of these transforms. Um, point transform in points. There we go. Uh, and we want to eventually find the one that is the outermost one. So we can make a variable out of that. Let's call it outermost. And then we want the, um, the dot product of the minimum one. So we need to we need to keep track of uh, what is the lowest dot product we have so far. Um, we can start at some absurd value that's like uh, obviously out of range. So whenever you want to find the lowest of something, um, I usually just start setting it to float dot max value. So then the first one is always guaranteed to be smaller than um, this value. Um, okay, so now we can start searching. Um, so. Uh, first, we need the dot product results of each each direction to all of these points. Um, so um, we need the actual point first. So that is point transform dot position. Uh, so now what we have is we have the actual location of each of these, and we have the direction here. Uh, so now we need to do the dot product between those two. Uh, so float dot equals vector two dot dot. Oh, we might want to do these. Um, so we probably want this to be relative to the camera, right? So we want to subtract the uh, camera position. Um, wait, why is this that? Oh, this is a vector three. Mm. I don't know how to get autocomplete to behave. Uh, all right. 
so we have the uh, point, uh, the relative point. Uh, so these points are now relative to the camera. So we get this vertex or this uh, vector rather than like from world space, because in world space, we could have the origin over here and the camera position would be like here or something, right? Uh, so we want that to be relative to the camera for this uh, dot product check to work. Um, okay. We want the direction to the point in this case. So direction to point, um, because it's already relative to the camera, we can just normalize that point. Um, there we go. So now we have the normalized direction to the point, and then we have the um, we have the direction of the camera. And now we can do the dot product between those two. So we do the dot product between the camera direction and the uh, direction to the point. So now we have a value for uh, that we were talking about in terms of the dot product. So um, so we ha if we start with this point, we're going to have to have the dot product between these two vectors, or rather um, these two vectors. Um, yeah, so this is going to be some low value, like uh, 0.9 or something, and so forth. Uh, but the goal is that after we've iterated through all of these, we want to find the one that's the outermost one. And that's when the dot product is going to be lower. And we have to do this, uh, we have to normalize them. Otherwise, the uh, depending on how far away these points are, they're going to affect the, um, the result of the dot product. But we don't want that to matter. That's why we have to normalize it. All right, so now we have the result of this one. Um, so is this lower than the one we found so far? That's what we need to check. So if the dot product to the current point is less than the lowest dot product we've found so far, uh, then we want to assign the outermost transform to the current one. OK, theoretically, we should now have the outermost points among all of these points. Uh, so that should be here. Oh, wait, we also need to assign the lowest dot product value because we kind of skipped over that. Um, so we want to set lowest dot equals dot. Otherwise, the, the next iteration, we're just going to assign all of them because all of them are less than the default value. So now we have a transform that is the outermost, but we don't know if that's correct yet uh, because, um, because we, we haven't tested this code. So let's draw a line to that. Um, to that point to make sure that we got this right. Uh, so, um, how do you shift a line up? Um, Alt and then up arrow, down arrow. Um, Gizmos dot draw line uh, from um, camera position to uh, uttermost dot position. Actually, let's make uttermost a uh, vector two. There we go. So I don't need to do the boilerplate stuff. Um, okay. Now I'm ignoring everything that has anything to do with range checking. If we have no points or if the points are behind the camera, all that stuff I'm going to ignore. Um, so there's a bunch of like things you would do in practice if you actually were to use this. Uh, but yeah. Um, Okay, this does not work. So this doesn't work because the point is in uh, local space. So that's when you tend to get these like confusing things happening. Uh, so instead of points, I guess we do point transform dot uh, position. Oh yeah, I rebound all of my keys in in uh, writer. So I <laughs> my advice might not be great. So now this one is pointing to a vertex. And it looks like it should be correct. It is now. It is pointing to the one that seems to be the outermost one, regardless of how we um, position this. So we move this one. We can see that it kind of like uh, snaps to the the one that's the newest outermost point. Um, so it seems to work, right? So now we have a way of finding the one that deviates the most from the camera. Okay. Uh, any questions about that so far? What do you say about if the dot was behind the camera? Oh, I just said that I'm ignoring that. Uh, I'm ignoring everything to do with what if the points are behind the camera and so forth. Because now those are just going to like clamp everything um, to to make the field of view like greater than uh, 180 degrees. So I'm just ignoring that case. 
and that would feel the view over 180 degrees. How would that even look? Um, it doesn't work with pr perspective projection. Uh, you need to use a different uh, projection for that. Uh, perspective kind of like explodes once you hit 180. Um, but it, you could use something like the, um, heck, which one is it? Stereographic or is that the other one? Um, Ashley, what projection is the spherical projection onto a dome? I want to say stereographic, but I'm not sure if that's the one. The one that just makes a, that, that like retains angles. I forget. Like the standard OpenGL or like the standard front rendering projection? No, not the perspective one. The, the one that you use in your uh, ray tracing. Oh, um, I mean, there's many of them, but the one that I use is... Stereographic popped up in my head, but I'm not sure if that's oh, the one. Something weird. Yeah, it is stereographic projection. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Stereographic. Neat. Stereographic is more that one. You can sort of go beyond 180 degrees field of view without it being completely broken. But will perspective projection over 180 just crash, or will it just look super weird? Um, I would guess that if you do field of view beyond 180, because the perspective projection is a linear transformation, um, I think your matrix would flip and you would get things uh, rendering behind the camera instead. I think that's how it would work. So I don't think it's very exciting. I think it would just get a flip view uh, once you pass 180 to the other side. Uh, so you wouldn't like you wouldn't technically get. Um, I don't think you would technically get more than one uh, 180. I used to use azimuthal equidistant projection. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Uh, everything good so far. Should we continue? Let's see. Now that we made this one the optimized version, um, that makes this one a little bit more tricky. <laughs> I think we messed this up a little bit, but you know what? Code is messy, and that's okay. Um, not sure what's going on with the calculations. Um, okay, so this little chunk is find outermost uh, point. Um, and the way we do that is that we kind of, we're not finding exactly the angle to each point, um, but we're doing a cheaper and faster version of that. Um, so this old section is just dedicated to find the outermost one. Um, so this is kind of the, uh, the dot product of the outermost one we've found so far. And this is the outermost point so far. So we're kind of updating these values as we iterate through all the points. Uh, so then we go through all the points that we have in front of us. So for each of these points, we do the dot product. Um, so we uh, this is the dot product we're doing. And this is just to set up the, the vectors the way that we want. How about checking the highest, lowest Y value and check against the camera's Y value? Uh, you could do that as well. Um, I am sort of like, uh, I guess I'm sort of like over preparing for the upcoming things that we're gonna do. Um, so, but yeah, you could do that as well. Uh, but the, the problems you're gonna sort of run into, you could have cases where, uh, I think, wait, I think that might actually work in this case. Um, I feel like that doesn't really do an angle calculation. Um, yeah, in this case, it wouldn't work, right? If you just check the Y values, it would think that this point is the outermost point, uh, but it isn't, right? Um, so now this one does have a higher Y value, uh, but it is actually not the outermost point angularly, right? Even though the Y coordinate of this one is higher. So this wouldn't actually capture um, this case. It would then leave this point outside if we presume that the one with the highest or lowest Y value um, is the, the outermost point, right? So we kind of need to check the angle to all of these points. But instead of checking angles, uh, we can just use the dot product because a dot product is sort of a cheaper way of checking the quote unquote angle. And so, so the way that the dot product works is that um, if the um, dot product between this direction and uh, this direction, they're very close to each other. So now the dot product is gonna be uh, pretty high, but the further away this points, the lower the dot product is gonna be. Uh, because again, the dot product is a projection um, a scalar projection onto the other vector. So it gives us a number for um, kind of how far along this arrow it is. So this is what the dot product gives us. Um, you know, the dot product between that arrow and that arrow. 
This calculation doesn't consider if the points behind the camera, though. Maybe clamp the value. Uh, yeah, I said it before that I'm just going to ignore uh, if they're behind the camera. I'm going to presume all of them are in front of the camera because there are a bunch of like edge cases we need to handle if we want to make this like a proper thing. Um, but that usually becomes something that's very context dependent because then it's like, what is it that you actually want to do in this game? Like, do you want to focus the things behind the camera or do you not? And if you don't want to focus them, uh, what happens when the camera moves backwards and it's suddenly within the view, should it just snap into place? Or like, there's a lot of like questions that arise uh, from doing that. So I'm just gonna ignore uh, the like edge cases of points behind the camera. So check if a point's X value is lower than the camera's X value. Uh, if you want, yeah, you could do that. Um, or you can, if you want to handle this case, uh, one thing you could do is if the dot product is negative, right? If you have a point behind the camera, then you're going to get the dot product between these two vectors. And this one is going to be a negative value. Uh, so all points um, like within this hemisphere, all of these are going to be negative. So that's a way of checking if it's in front of or behind the camera. If you want something that is like coordinate independent, because um, as soon as you start checking the y value and the x values, um, then you need to make sure that it, you know, you want to handle the rotation, rotation of the camera and everything. So, uh, but if it's in, if the if the point is in the local space of the camera, then yes, you can just check the. Um, I guess it would be the z value in this case because um, cameras are z forward. Then doing the dot product is just equivalent to getting the uh, z coordinate. Uh, how expensive is transform inverse transform point direction vector? Um, it's three vector scalar multiplications, I believe. Um, no, four. Um, so it's, it can be expensive if you do a lot of them. Um, so it really depends. I think transform direction is the most expensive one because that one also normalizes. So, um, so, so whenever you're using like, um, if you're using transform direction, in some cases you can use transform vector instead to save some performance if you know that it's already normalized and you don't have any like non-uniform scale somewhere or whatever. But yeah, it's a, um, <clears throat> um, are we allowed to transform the points world space positions into cameras local space? Yes, absolutely. It's normalized and expensive operation. Does it use square root? Yes. Well, I, I mean, it depends on how you define expensive, right? Um, like, the, there are many things that are way more expensive than a square root. Um, the square root isn't that expensive um, compared to many other things. Uh, it's not like a square root is equivalent to, uh, you know, 5,000 multiplies. Um, yeah, I, as far as I know, the square root is closer to, um, I don't know, four multiplies, six multiplies. I'm not sure. I think, is that correct? How expensive is the square root if we compare it to like a multiply? Pretty expensive. Is it like equivalent to 5,000 multiplies or like five or? Wild guess, 50? 50, okay. I think. Um, also probably depends on if you're running a CPU or GPU code. Uh, CPU code in this case. Yeah. It's always good to have Ashley around. Sorry if I'm interrupting your work <laughs> with yeah, random good. questions. Oh, it actually, I think it might be a little faster. Mm -hmm. Or no, maybe not. I don't know. It's hard to read this. Gotcha. CPUs are complicated. But approximately. It's not at the magnitude of 5,000 multiplies. No. Yeah. Yeah, it's around like 10 to 50 mm -hmm. multiplies. Cool. Uh, also, apparently, inverse square root is much faster than square root. Right. Does C sharp have that as a function? Um, yeah, C sharp is CPU code. Shada Lab is, well, Shada Lab is technically a wrapper for the actual shader code. Uh, so shader live is just Unity's code that wraps the actual shader. But yeah, if you want to have GPU code, then that's generally like HLSL or CG um, in Unity. Okay, so the if statement just needs an extra argument. Um, well, that one, for instance, doesn't handle the case where all the points are behind the camera. So like, as soon as you start getting into like fixing edge cases, there are a lot of edge cases you need to fix. Um, same thing with like, the camera technically doesn't support the, the 180 degree field of view, and you probably don't want that high of a field of view and so forth. Um, right, so we found the outermost point, but we actually never set the field of view of the camera. <laughs> so that might be a good idea. Okay, let's, let's actually set the field of view before skipping ahead. So we now know the dot product to um, to the outermost point. Uh, so we have this vector, and then we got the dot product out of out of this right? But if you remember, if we have the dot product between two normalized vectors, um, we can actually get the angle out of that. Remember how when we had two normalized vectors? Here we go. If we have two normalized vectors, then the dot product between those two 
is going to be equal the cosine of the angle between those two vectors. And then we need to restart the document in Photoshop because Photoshop is garbage. So we can use the you can use you can use this fact to figure out the the angle. Um, so we also talked about the uh, trigonometric functions of the cosine and its inverse arc cosine or a cosine. <clears throat> so if we shuffle these around, uh, we can actually get uh, a formula that allows us to calculate the angle um, given two normalized vectors. Great. So this is what we have now, right? We've already calculated this dot product. So if we go back to the code, we have the lowest dot product result here. Um, so we can then use that to figure out the angle. So we can go to our, let's say, float uh, angle in radians equals math dot uh, a cosine. So that's the inverse cosine, where we then want to pass the dot product into that. So that's the lowest dot that we found because we did assign it every time we iterate. And then once we found the lowest dot product, we still have that value even after all of these iterations. Um, so we do the R cosine of the lowest dot product and that gives us the angle. Um, so, so now we have the angle in front of the camera uh, to this point, but we haven't actually assigned the field of view. So what we got is this angle. We have this angle now, but we need to assign it as field of view. And a field of view in Unity is the vertical field of view of the total angle here. Um, <clears throat> so we want to take this angle, multiply it by two, and then we get the full uh, span, right? Um, go back here. Um, and then we do uh, camera dot field of view. And Unity says that this is in degrees for some reason. Jeez. Um, so angle in radians uh, times uh, times two, because I want it to be twice as big. <clears throat> and then we want to convert this to degrees. So we can use math dot radians to degrees. Um, so that should be enough for setting the field of view. So let's see if it works. So now the camera is fully adapted to this point. And if we move the camera, you can see that it kind of sticks to um, sticks to these points to make sure that, that all the points fit within view. Um, so, so there we go. That's the, that's the first assignment. And I'm sorry, I sort of skipped over a bunch of things <laughs> at first. Um, okay. Any questions on that before we move on? Uh, if I want the camera to just back up to capture all objects rather than changing the field of view, then the equation would look different, right? Then we would go back to this case right here. And then we think about what data do we have? So if we have a, a fixed field of view, then uh, let's see, we have a fixed field of view and we sort of know the outermost points as well. Uh, so then the, the thing we would need to figure out would be the adjacent, right? We want to know the distance or the distance uh, that satisfies this angle so that the opposite is of a specific length. Um, so you would sort of do the same thing. You would kind of just plug in the values that you have in order to figure out the values that, that you don't have, right? Uh, you would still use this one then. Um, so, so in this case, it would be, let's see, which one would it be? Uh, actually, do we have opposite? Uh, yes, we do. Um, so so then, then what you would do, do is basically sh shuffle this function around until you have the opposite on its own side. Uh, so you would multiply the, no, sorry, the adjacent on one side. Um, yeah. Uh, so that would be uh, O or like adjacent equals um, O divided by the tangent of alpha. And then you will get the uh, adjacent here, which is a distance that the camera should place itself, right? Um, so, so it's sort of like, it's sort of the same problem, but we just swap around the ones that we know versus the ones that we don't know. And then you can set the camera position based on that. So, so these are just whenever you need to solve a triangle uh, or right angle triangle specifically, um, these are super, super useful. Oh, if you want to know the algebra to get to this function, um, essentially what we do is we multiply both sides by A. So that removes A here uh, and adds it here. So now it's uh, A multiplied by 
tangent of alpha. And then we divide both sides by tangent of alpha. So then it's uh, just a on this side and um, o divided by tangent of alpha. So that's kind of the, the way you would shuffle things around. So essentially what we're doing is where we're swapping uh, these two values. Oh, someone asked a good question. Uh, how can you set the field of view with two points, the highest and the lowest? Um, <clears throat> so if you want two points to be the highest and the lowest, uh, then it's kind of a, um, then you cannot only set the field of view uh, because then you also need to set the Y position of the camera, right? Because then you need to make sure that the Y position of the camera makes it so that the uh, vertices are centered angularly, right? Would it actually be the length of O divided by tangent A to get the length of adjacent? Yes. Uh, but that, that is possible. It's just that you need to set the uh, Y coordinate as well. Um, you would just have more unknowns. Uh, I'm actually not entirely sure how you would set that up. Um, it's kind of an interesting math problem, uh, but I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. It, I think just starting out by drawing all the triangles, all the information that you have versus don't have and so forth is a good starting point. Oh, by the way, you can set the field of view so that it actually matches here without moving the camera, but then you get into really weird projection matrices. <laughs> so it is possible, um, but it gets very complicated. Um, all right, so, so now we want to set the radius of each of these. So let's start out by making a component that we can attach to all of these objects that, uh, where we can set the radius. Let's call it field of view points. So this is sort of going to be a stand-in for a bounding box of some objects that we want to adapt the field of view to. So uh, let's make a range radius default to 0.5. Actually, not that much. That's kind of all we need, I think. We can draw the radius and stuff in the uh, field of view thing. We added this to all the scripts. Let's recompile. Uh, let's go back to the camera. Um, Okay, so we want to make sure that uh, we can see all of the, the radii of these objects, right? So let's make a separate function for that just for cleanliness. Um, so draw point um, radii. Um, Let's see, can we actually make this? I don't know if we can assign this through the inspector with the array assignment if we tr change this to use the field of viewpoint, but maybe. All right, I'm just refactoring this to, to use the uh, field of viewpoints object instead. And let's see if this is assignable. Yes, radii is the plural of radius. Okay, that worked, good. So now this array, instead of referring to the transforms, uh, it's now referring to the uh, field of view point components of these objects. Uh, so that way we have more like a, of a direct access to the radii. Uh, okay, so now we can draw all the points. Um, so let's see, we can just iterate through all the points for each. Uh, field of view points and points. Um, draw um, gizmos. Draw wire sphere at field of view points dot transform dot position with a radius of uh, field of view point dot radius. All right, so this is just for debugging purposes, so we can see what's going on. Um, and we should always like make sure that we actually call our functions. Classic mistake to forget to call your functions. Uh, so now we can see the radius that we've assigned to all of these, but we're not using it yet. Um, so we can uh, change the radius of each of these points. Um, so let's assign some various radii. The points in the middle are probably not going to matter that much, uh, but we can use these to debug them later. Um, all right, now we have a new problem, right? Now we... Um, when we calculate the angle to each of these, uh, we suddenly have a, a bit of a more complicated setup. Um, so let's see how this works. And again, every time you have a math problem, always, always, always like think about what is the information you have, what is the information you want, and then you can sort of like work everything out from there. Um, so what do we have? Well, we have our camera. Didn't mean to move all of my canvas. And the camera implies its position, direction, all of that stuff. And then we have a point 
with a given radius. You know what? Drawing circles is hard. Now we need to figure out how we can actually get the um, angle to this one. But we, we don't just want the angle this time. Um, so what we calculated before was the angle relative to the direction of the camera. So then we got this angle right here which worked for points, but it's not enough for when we're working with a radius, right? Uh, so what we want now is that we want to, we want to get the point that makes it so that we kind of hug the circle. Actually, let's undo that one to make it a little bit more clear. Eh. There we go. Nailed it. Okay. So here's something that might be a little tricky because while what we had before, uh, was a relatively simple problem where we had a direction to this point and then we could just get the angle. But now we have something a little bit different. And crucially, this is the angle that is 90 degrees now. Um, I think there, um, I think it's pretty easy to uh, sort of make the mistake that because the camera is looking in this direction, um, you then sort of do. Um, the 90 degree angle somewhere else, or you do this triangle. Uh, but that's not actually what we want. We want this 90 degree angle because if you're looking at the edge of a circle, that is always tangent to uh, the normal here. Uh, so now we we have another pro like another triangle problem, right? Um, and this is a right angle triangle. So we can use all the all the stuff that we've used before to uh, to figure out this angle. So now we have a new angle we need to figure out. Uh, which is this one, or I guess technically we want this full angle. Uh, but I think for now, uh, it's probably easier to just take this angle and then add this angle. Uh, there might be ways of like simplifying the whole thing. Uh, but for now, uh, let's just focus on, on adding those two angles so we can uh, solve this right angle triangle. Um, and again, now we need to think about um, what information do we have? What information do we not have? Um, okay, we want this angle. This is the information we don't have that we want. All right, so what, what information do we have? We do have the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse here is the distance to the point, right? Uh, so let's use the same terminology as up here. So uh, we have the um, hypotenuse um, and the opposite in this case is this one. Uh, and that is the radius of the circle because any uh, vector going out to the edge of the circle is going to be the length of the radius of that circle. Um, so we know the opposite too, and that's the that's the radius. Um, or in this case, it's O. Um, I don't know if we should use R or O here, uh, but let's stick to the terminology of the stuff above. Um, cool. So now we, we have two sides of this triangle, and we know that this is a 90 degree angle, so then we can use the uh, 90 degree angle formulas that we have above. And then we need to restart the Photoshop document because Jesus Christ. So we have the hypotenuse and we have the opposite. And then let's just refer to our chart. Uh, how do we get the angle? We have the hypotenuse and the opposite. Um, last time we had the opposite and adjacent, uh, but this one doesn't actually give us what we want uh, because we don't know this distance. Uh, the adjacent one is unknown to us. And uh, yeah, so anything containing the adjacent goes away. We can't use that. Uh, but sine of alpha is the opposite over the hypotenuse. And we know both of these. Um, so so now we can do exactly the same thing we did with the, um, the tangent function. Uh, we can take this function and shuffle it around a bit. Uh, so copy that. So we know the hypotenuse. Um, we know the... Um, we know the op opposite and we want the angle. So we can then apply the, um, we can apply the inverse sine, fun sine, fun uh, inverse sine function or arc sine. Uh, so we shuffle this around as in we do the arc sine of both sides of this equal sign. Um, so they're going to cancel out on this end and we're going to be left with them only on the other end. Uh, actually, let's, let's do this. Oh God, we were not going to fit everything. Oh geez. There we go. Pixel perfect box selection. Hell yeah. Okay. Uh, so now we have a formula where we can get the angle using the arc sign and then do the opposite over the hypotenuse. So now if we, we can take this one, let's look here. 
and we can just apply all of this information. Um, and we can we can rephrase this to be a little bit more um, uh, like readable in code because in in terms of opposite and hypotenuse they're a bit abstract. Um, so in this case, the um, hypotenuse is the distance to the point. The opposite is the radius of the circle. Uh, so we can rephrase this if we want to. So the opposite is the radius. And the hypotenuse, hypotenuse is the uh, distance, and that's it. So, so now we now we can calculate all of this. Let's go to code. <clears throat> um, so now we, uh, I'm probably going to unoptimize this now, um, because now we need to add these angles together before knowing what the outermost point is. And I'm not entirely sure if we can just use the dot products to figure that out. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna I'm gonna unoptimize this by uh, moving the angle calculation back into this function. Uh, so then the lowest dot is no longer going to be lowest dot. Um, it's going to be the uh, I guess it would be the highest angle actually, right? Uh, so I'm gonna move that into there. Um, so let's see what we what we need here is the um, what do we call this? It's the the maximum angular deviation. I'm not entirely sure what to call it. Um, outermost angle, maybe. Maybe that's good. OK, so in this case, we kind of reverse this, because the outermost angle increases the further away we go. So we want to find the uh, maximum value instead of the minim minimum one. So I'm going to reverse the logic of this. Um, so we calculate the dot here. Uh, in this case, we actually want the uh, angle instead. So uh, there we go. So this is the angle to the point. This does not include anything we've done before so far. Um, so, um, so we check if the angle to point is greater than the outermost angle. And if so, we assign the angle to point to the outermost angle. Um, yeah, and maybe we should specify that this is in radians. And then we assign the field of view. So, so far, everything should work the same as it did before, but now we're calculating the angle for every iteration. Um, yeah, seems to still work, so that's good. Did everyone follow on that so far, or was that really confusing? I know sometimes I like refactor too quickly, um, but essentially what I did was to, instead of just using the raw dot product value, uh, we check the literal angle every time. Um, so we want to find the angle that deviates too far away from the forward direction. Um, yeah, I think it works better if I show the theory first and the code later, um, because I, I feel like the, the graphical representation of being able to draw is more useful, um, at least initially. And then the code is going to be like, okay, now it's the practical side of things, right? <clears throat> Uh, so now we have the angle to the point, and right now we're presuming that we only care about the point here. We're ignoring radius so far. Um, so we have the angle to the point, um, but we don't have the uh, angle given the radius that we got, right? Uh, so what we need to do is cal calculate this one. Uh, angle to point, uh, we already have that one. Uh, that is the one that we calculated over here. Uh, this one. So we have this angle, and all we need to do is add them in order to figure out the deviation of this point, right? Uh, so we calculate both of these, add them together, and then we get the full angle for both of these. It was a little confusing to have the H there. I don't know if I should move that. Am I the only one getting kind of anxious using radians since I know it's not precise because of tau being infinite and all? I mean, it's not precise in degrees either because floating point works the way it does, so... It's all garbage. There's no way of getting out of, getting out of that. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, right. So we have the angle to the point. Everything is garbage and nothing is consistent. Yes, of course. So um, we have the blue one, the angle to the point, but we need to calculate this one. How do we do that? Well, we have our formula here. We need to do the arc sine of the radius divided by the distance to the point. All right. Floats. Um, let's see, what do we call this? It's sort of the radius angle, um, radius angular span. There we go. 
in radians. <laughs> That's going to get confusing. All right, so we want to do the arc sine of the uh, radius divided by the distance. So the radius is given by, we, we, that's just a constant in the, the object, the field of view point dot radius. Uh, and then we um, divide that by the distance and the distance to the point, um, we have that one here, right? We have the, the point here and we have the direction to the point. Um, so this point is relative to, um, to the camera. So if we get the length of this vector, we get the um, distance to it. We maybe should call it point relative because it's um, specifically because it's relative to the camera. Um, so distance to point uh, equals point relative dot magnitude. And here we could optimize if we want to. Um, so because normalization works by dividing by the length, uh, we could actually do like a little optimization here by getting the distance to the point first. And then in order to calculate the direction, uh, we do the points relative divided by the distance to the points. So this is actually the same thing as normalizing, but faster. Um, <clears throat> um, so whenever you need like both the distance and the direction, uh, you can do this little um, like manual calculation of the normalized vector and you're, you're going to have a slightly faster code. Sometimes it's useful. Um, but I like to leave comments if you have like really esoteric math operations. It's really important that it's like readable. Uh, all right, so now we have the distance. So uh, the arc sine of the radius divided by the distance should give us the um, this red angle right here. Okay. Um, so then all we need to do is to add these together, right? Um, uh, so let's call it angular deviation. Uh, that's going to be angle to point plus radius angular span. So now we're adding these together in order to get the, the full span of both of these. So then we replace our angle to point with angular deviation. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, cool. So let's go back, recompile, and there we go. So now you can see that the field of view is actually adapting to the radius of this object. Um, so we move this around, change the radius. The field of view will now adapt to, to this radius too. Um, any questions about that? That was a very, a very mathematical problem. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can show you the code. How do you select and replace all instances of angle to point past that point? Um, so I have a shortcut. I've rebound it, so I don't know what the default is in whatever ID you're using. Um, but if I select something and do control D, I'll do, I'll select the next match. Um, which is really useful. Um, but again, I rebound all of my keys. So, uh, but yeah, so like if you, if I want to select this, I can just do control D, control D, and then type int and I, I'll replace all that with integer. Um, super, super useful. I use it a lot. Um, yeah, it's really neat. If we're like going 3D, I can just do control D, change it to vector three, and now it's all vector three. Um, yeah, it's a really useful like um, productivity thing. Why are floats used so often as opposed to what? doubles or oh um yeah the um i mean they're they're smaller uh faster to calculate um so yeah it's it's just that we, we generally don't need to use higher precision than that uh, sometimes you do uh, but quite often you don't so it's just cheaper in many ways both like performance wise and memory wise here's the implementation of draw point radii yeah i think it's called select next match or something like that also we could totally like we can collapse this into a single link query if we want to. Oh wait, it doesn't have the oh, because I made an extension method for that. Never mind. <laughs> we can't do that. Rip. Did you just use shapes? Uh no, I'm not using shapes in this course because I want every student to be able to just copy my code and use it in Unity without having my plugin. Alright, 
uh, let's see, what was the last thing? The last thing was uh, we need to make sure that this works in any uh, rotation for the camera. The, like the camera should be able to um, have um, any rotation and all of the, the field of view fitting and all of that should work regardless. Uh, this is something that is can conceptually seem kind of difficult. Um, like if you haven't, um, like if you start figuring out, it's like, okay, but then we have the, uh, you know, the, the Z axis of the camera, uh, we have the, the X axis, um, and then we have the, you know, the Y axis, and then we're going to be like, okay, what if we project against the Y axis and so forth? Like things can get complicated. Um, but if you know how spaces work and the fact that you can transform things between spaces, um, this becomes a pretty straightforward problem. Uh, there's like only one small tweak we need to do in order to make this work. Um, because right now, I don't think this actually works um, because the, um, the angle to point in this case presumes a two-dimensional coordinate, right? Um, but as soon as we go 3D, um, these could be anywhere uh, in terms of like um, uh, laterally as well, not just, um, sorry, uh, horizontally as well. Um, yeah, so all we need to do essentially is to uh, make sure that these points are transformed into the space of the camera and then we do everything we've done before uh, except we um, we do it in the space uh, of the camera itself. Uh, so if we now uh, do this and rotate, it still works for rotation in 2D. So that's neat. Uh, and the, the reason that works is because we're we're not really uh, we're doing the dot product with a forward vector um, of the camera. If we just um, if we use some other method of like presuming coordinate spaces, uh, then uh, this might not have worked. Yeah, but as soon as we start. Uh, rotating the camera where we're not presuming a 2D coordinate system. Uh, now the field of view is completely off. It's way too big. And if we rotate the camera, it's just going to grow and it's, it's just not working at all. Um, yeah. So now we need to transform these into the space of the camera. Uh, so, so what we need to do now is that, um, Basically, we need to convert these things into the first into the local space of the camera, uh, but then we need to swizzle them so that we can project them into 2D. Um, because right now, the as you know, the camera's forward vector is Z, um, but when we do the 2D operations, we work with two components, which is X and Y. Um, so we then need to, um, what's usually called swizzle, when you're kind of mixing the components of vectors or it's like shuffling them around, that's usually called swizzling, uh, especially in shader coding. Um, but first, let's just transform these into the space of the camera. Okay, so if we are in the, um, if we're going to transform these into local space, then there, there are a bunch of things that, that are going to happen sort of automatically. Um, first off, when we get the camera direction, if we want to do this in local space, then the camera direction is just vector three dot forward, right? Uh, because no matter how we rotate this camera, um, it's just always going to be forward. That is the direction of the camera. Um, so we're going to rewrite this now because now we're going to switch to using world space to using local space of the camera. So this is just going to be forward. Um, or in other words, this is just 0, 0, 1. This is the, the vector 3 containing these values. Uh, camera position in this case is going to be 0, right? The camera position um, is at the origin of its own space. So we don't actually need the camera position anymore. That's just 0. Uh, so let's delete that. Uh, and if we take the position of something and subtract zero, nothing happens. So we can just remove that subtraction. So we have the camera direction. Uh, and let's, let's just go through all of these and see what we then need to change. Um, let's see. So we have the uh, outermost point. Uh, now we can start talking about like whether or not we want to uh, work in like a projected uh, plane of like, do we want to flatten, <clears throat> do we want to flatten these to 2D, uh, or do we, or do we want to work with these in some other way? Uh, let's see. I actually don't know which one we should do. Um, it might be more descriptive to use, uh, to not use the projected space for now. I think that might be easier. 
uh, to ignore um, like projecting things. Uh, it's not as good in terms of performance, but it's probably easier to uh, wrap your head around. Okay, so uh, let's let's work with vector threes now. So we're we're moving on to three D. Uh, so I'm just gonna naively uh, replace a bunch of things. Um, do, do, do. Vector three. There we go. So now we're iterating through the points. We are. Uh, we want to get the point here, and this point is supposed to be relative uh, to the camera. Uh, but previously, we were just subtracting the camera position so that it was relative in uh, it was relative in world space. But now we want this to be uh, relative to the local space of the camera. So here's where we need to do some transformation. Um, so um, so we need to do camera dot um, uh, inverse transform point because we want to go from or sorry camera dot transform dot inverse transform um, point. So this one transforms the point from um, world space to local space. Let's just call it point. <clears throat> What do you mean by doing it with a projected space? Um, so we could project these into a two-dimensional space so that they sort of become the same case as a 2D case. Um, but I'm not sure if that might be more confusing or less confusing because we need to uh, swizzle the vectors because then the uh, generally in 2D space, then we're going to use the x and y axis. But if we want to project these onto looking like our old case like this, uh, the camera has the z and y axis. So that's what I mean by project the space. Or actually, it might be easier to do that. Um, yeah, it's probably easier, actually. So um, let's do that then. So um, what this means is that we're going to flatten all of these points um, so that they are all in a line here. Um, only mathematically, just flatten them there, right? OK, so so this point now is the point in local space. Um, and if we want to uh, make sure that these are in the projective space, which is the plane of the x-axis, uh, we're going to flatten everything on the x-axis. Um, then um, we're going to get a vector 2. And then we're going to do, let's see, that's going to be the, the point um, flattened, let's see. Um, so now we want a 2D coordinate that represents the local space position of this, but we want the X coordinate to be um, what was previously the Z coordinate, because now moving these points in uh, this direction is along the Z axis of the camera, uh, but we want this that to be an X coordinate. Um, but the y coordinate, though, uh, is still consistent. Um, oops, sorry. Um, so, so this is still the y coordinate of the camera because you can see the axis pointing uh, along this axis. But the, but we want this to be the x axis, not the z axis, because we want to use vector twos. Long story short, what that means is that we're going to do a new vector two, uh, and then we're going to get this point in local space. Um, where the x-axis is going to be uh, what previously was the z-axis. So this is going to be the point local dot z, and then the y-axis is going to be the point local dot y, because this one is already aligned in our uh, projected space. Uh, so point local dot y. <clears throat> okay. So this is sort of uh, local to... Um, to a, uh, I don't even know what to call this. It's like a, a projected space on the, where everything is projected onto the plane of the x-axis. Um, I don't know, 2D space. I don't know what to call it. Um, it's the the like it's the zy plane. Local 3D to local 2D ZY plane space of the camera. There we go. <clears throat> um, OK, so as soon as we have this point now, the point flat one, um, the coordinate space looks exactly like this, where um, 0 is at the camera. And this is the x-axis uh, here in terms of how we've defined these coordinates now. 
and this is the y-axis. Even though this is not the axis of the camera transform itself, that is how we've represented these points so far. Okay. <clears throat> um, so now we have the point in this projected 2D space, um, because this is a 2D space, right? Um, so now we're sort of back to the same case we had before. Uh, we had the uh, point relative, it's just going to be the point flat. Same thing here, we're going to uh, go back to using vector 2s. Why do you project the z-axis on the x-axis though? Aren't you supposed to make it so that it makes it bigger if it moves closer to the camera? And only off to the side if it isn't centered. Uh, what do you mean by moves closer to the camera? Like on what axis? And I'm not really projecting the z-axis onto the x-axis, I'm mostly swapping them around. Uh, because in the camera, the local space of the camera says that the, the z-axis is this direction. But if we want to convert this to a two-dimensional coordinate um, that uses these two vectors, then like in terms of terminology, then this would be our x-axis, right, in that plane. Uh, because we don't actually care about uh, where the points are along this axis. That doesn't matter for the calculations that we're doing now. Because again, we're only caring about the vertical field of view. We don't care about the horizontal one. Uh, so horizontal offset doesn't matter. Um, so given that it doesn't matter, we can just discard that coordinate. Um, so, so that's kind of what we're doing here. Uh, we don't care about the x-coordinate of, of these points. We can just project them into a two-dimensional coordinate um, using the z-axis, uh, which is the position along this direction, and the y-axis, which is the position along this direction. And as soon as we do that, we're now back to a 2D problem here. Um, actually, it's slightly more simple than that. But yes, okay. Uh, so we have the distance to the point, we have the uh, direction to the point, and now we want the angle to the point. Okay, so we do the dot product between the direction of the camera and the direction to the point. But if you think about it, what is the direction to the camera now in this projected uh, 2D space? Well, the direction of the camera is this axis, which in the projected space that we have now uh, is just the um, uh, pointing to the right. So this is vector 2 dot right, which is the same thing as 1, 0. So that's our camera direction in this uh, flattened projected space. Um, so what we're doing is a dot product between this projected space and the direction to the point. Um, but if you are familiar with how the dot product works, uh, then given that this is just 1 and 0, uh, we can actually skip the dot product altogether here. Uh, we could, in this case, um, use the x-coordinate of the direction to the point. Uh, it's a little bit esoteric, uh, so I'm not sure if I want to do that now, but basically um, this would be the same um, mathematical operation, but computationally this is faster, uh, but this is a little bit unreadable. Um, so to me, the arc cosine of the dot product is a very clear like way to get the angle between two uh, vectors. Um, but anyway, so we could do that, um, we could collapse that if we want to, but I think this is a little bit more readable. Let's see, we're drawing a line from the outermost points. I guess we, maybe we don't have to do that anymore. Um, okay, otherwise I'm pretty sure this should still work. I don't think we need to change anything else. Unless I missed something. We'll see what happens. Uh, there we go. Alright, so that seems to work. It seems like this sphere is lining up with the, uh, with the camera. So if we move the camera, the camera is now going to hug that point. And then it's going to hug the point down there. Um, and now since this is like in 3D, uh, we can start rotating the camera. And the camera is still going to adapt. Um, to the spheres that we have here, no matter uh, the orientation of the camera and no matter how we've positioned it. Um, yeah, um, so that's that's that. All right, that was the assignment. There we go, we went through it all. Oh, this is not used anymore. Wait, or hold on. Oh yeah, no, we just need the angle. Um, that is true. Yeah, we can skip this one. Probably just because I wanted to draw it, but should rename this to projected space. Hmm. OK. 
Can I join if I'm not in Sweden? Uh, this course that I'm teaching right now is open to the public, uh, but the entirety of Future Games is like a long education of like two years. Um, I don't think you can remote join Future Games um, unless the rules have changed with coronavirus and everything, uh, but I'm pretty sure you have to live in Sweden to uh, apply to it. But yeah, if you want to follow this course specifically, um, then yes, you can do that. The The course that I'm teaching uh, is public, so feel free to uh, feel free to go to that link all the previous lectures are there. The assignments are there if you want to do the assignments. Um, yeah, so this is the course. This is a course on like math for game developers uh, specifically. Can we make the camera point to the average position of the points. Sure, that's something we can do. But then we need to presume an up vector. That's radical. But sure, why not? Point to center. So field of view calculation has to happen after, otherwise the otherwise it's gonna be wrong. Really important concept in general. Make sure you do things in the right order. So if we wanted to point to the center, we need to first find the center. What is the center? Um so let's do a vector three center. Uh, equals vector three dot zero. Uh, iterate through all the points. Center plus equals. So if you want to get the average of some data, uh, you add them all together and then you divide by the number of data points. Um, so in this case, we add all the locations of all of these points. So, uh, so point dot transform dot position. So we add that to this vector, this center vector, and then we want to divide by the number of points. So center divided by um, points dot count uh, length, I guess. So now we have the average points of all of these. Um, I don't know if we can do a link expression for that. Uh, if there's um, <clears throat> uh, if it allows you to use vectors, no, we would have to make an extension method for that. Uh, aggregate looks gross. No, I think this is more descriptive. So, um, now we have the center point, then we just need the direction, <coughs> direction from the camera to the center points. Uh, so, uh, vector three, direction to center equals, uh, camera dot transform dot position, sorry, center minus camera position. There we go. This gives us the direction to center, and then we want the camera to look at that point. Um, so we do uh, camera dot transform dot rotation equals uh, quaternion dot look rotation. And here we need to make a decision. Uh, we know the direction to the center, but what is the up vector? Um, if we want this camera to kind of be able to drift. Um, as in the roll could be anything, uh, and we sort of wanted to just get the shortest uh, rotation toward the point, um, then we could use the up vector of the camera itself. Uh, if we want the camera to always have a roll so that the up vector of the camera is aligned with you know, the gravity vector, then we would pass in vector 3.up, which is the default behavior. Um, so it kind of depends on how we want to do this. Um, I think it's fun to just allow it to drift. Uh, so I'm going to say camera.transform.up. Um, did we do everything? I think we did. Um, wait, it's not actually setting the rotation. Oh, because we're not, we haven't checked the box. Um, there we go. Points to center. So now if we move this around, it's like really annoying because it's like messing with our up vectors. Uh, does European Unity get better quality graphics? The standard one or only performance benefits? Um, I would guess that it's both. Um, like URP, th they're still developing URP for like multiple platforms. Um, and they, I'm pretty sure on some platforms it's more optimized than the built-in pipeline. So I'm pretty sure you would like, it would both look better and be more optimized in general, depending on like what features you enable and whatnot. Um, yeah, 
Um, HDRP is generally much more expensive, so you can't do like mobile platforms and HDRP. So if you want to develop for the Switch or mobile or anything else that's portable, uh, then generally um, you you would you would use URP or the built-in pipeline. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Otherwise, URP. Um, URP and HDRP are in general a nightmare to target if you are a shader coder. Uh, so for me, I personally still use the built-in pipeline uh, because the uh, writing shaders for URP and HDRP is really, really difficult. Um, so yeah, which is really frustrating. So I'm I'm sad about the state of URP and HDRP. Um, but yeah, so in HDRP and URP, you would generally use a shader graph to make shaders. Uh, but shader graph is limited in various ways. So that like me, as someone who likes to code shaders by hand, I'm bummed out by the fact that shader graph is sort of the, the thing we're supposed to use for URP and HDRP. Um, but it's limited in terms of features. So I, I want to use uh, write code by hand, but writing code by hand in URP and HDRP um, is really complicated uh, because they've started wrapping so many things in macros and stuff so that it looks almost completely different from writing shaders in the built-in pipeline. Um, but that's mostly an issue if you want to make sure that you support all the post-processing features, all the lighting features, all the features in URP and HDRP. Um, so for me personally, um, I I have just decided to like work in the um, mostly work um, in the built-in pipeline and in terms of lighting and stuff I pretty much always write my own lighting systems uh, so I don't care about like Unity's lighting or whatever uh, so I I just use my own uh, stuff regardless so I just stick to the built-in pipeline because um, I sort of have my own pipeline workflow um, yeah. I've been looking into shader coding with URP. It is indeed a nightmare, but there are certain things you can do to make life a lot easier. Yeah. I mean, it depends on what you want to support, right? Does shader coding work well with post effects or is that included in URP? Um, I mean, for a lot of shaders, you need to make sure that you have support for post effects. Um, like both URP and HDRP has like, both of them have post process effects that relies on something called motion vectors. And motion vectors is, um, a shader pass in your objects that can render a vector onto a motion vector buffer so that you can detect um, how is the like in what direction is this object moving and how quickly. Um, so that's kind of a, a render pass that allows you to get that information. Um, so that, that's motion vectors and that's used for motion blur and um, temporal anti-aliasing and various things like that. Uh, but um, you have to write that yourself. If you want to have support for motion vectors, you need to implement that yourself in your shaders. And that's just one example. Um, you, you need like a depth pass. Uh, you need like a bunch of other passes if you want to support some of the more experimental features of HDRP. Um, it's in general, um, it's in general a lot. Um, but if you don't want to like support like all the fancy features, then it's sort of kind of close to what you had before. But yeah. Wow. Okay. All right. Um, uh, let's see, let's maximize this. Here's an example of esoteric fun ray tracing projects. Um, so this is, this is a fractal. Um, this is the, something that my girlfriend introduced me to. Uh, she's been working on like a, a path tracer, uh, that can, uh, it's basically a path tracer for uh, the Mandel box, and this is a fractal. Um, so this entire shape um, is entirely mathematically defined. It's a it's a very short mathematical function that allows us to create this shape that we're looking at right now. Um, so yeah, this is the Mandel box fractal. Um, so what what this means is that we can like literally tweak parameters, and all of this is going to change in real time. Uh, so if I scroll, I can change the parameters of the fractal and you can see that it's kind of changing its uh, behavior and look and everything. Um, yeah. Um, and yes, this is the mandel box. Um, and the, the really like beautiful thing about this, <laughs> or one of the, one of my favorite things about this rather, uh, is that if we go to the scene view, um, it's literally a camera with two triangles in front of it <laughs> that is moving around the world. Um, so if I select this, you can see that this is how how it's made, <laughs> which is kind of neat. 
Um, so, so all of this is uh, two triangles with a single shader that is rendering all of this. Uh, so uh, all of the code for this lies in the shader itself, um, and it's sort of creating this fake geometry. Um, yeah. So this this doesn't exist. It's just two triangles. Um, anyway, that's ray tracing or parts of the ray tracing. This could never run full screen on my uh, 1080 Ti, uh, but this is actually running full screen, uh, and it seems to be relatively smooth as well. So I'm a little intimidated by this. Um, yeah, we're at 300 FPS. Holy shit! Ooh, <laughs> this would this would be like five FPS <laughs> on my old GPU. So okay, I guess guess this GPU is better actually. Is it purely GPU improvements? Just GPU improvements. Uh, last time I ran this, is, it was on a 1080 Ti, um, and I dropped to like 10, 5 FPS if I tried to full screen this, and now I'm running it on the um, 390, and it's it's now, uh, let's see, this frame is 160 FPS, um, 900. If we go closer, it's going to be slower. Um, so now we're down to 100 FPS. But anyway, ray tracing like this is kind of like, um, it's mostly esoteric. Like you never really use this in games unless you make a game about the mantle box fractal or whatever, or if you make like a very specific like art style or whatever. But usually, oh, actually, uh, Dreams is a game that is heavily using um, ray tracing in sign distance fields. Uh, otherwise, most games don't don't use ray tracing like this. Uh, yes, this is uh, remarching with uh, sign distance fields, depending on how strict you want to be with the definition of a sign distance field. So we are running pretty short on time. Um, so I don't know how much we'll be able to go through in terms of everything that I'd planned. Um, so I think I might be doing these a little bit quickly with not too many practical examples. Yeah, because I figured like having the theory is like one of the most important parts and then um, you'll be able to on your own use these things and figure these things out, I hope. Um, so I might go a little bit faster or not and I might go a little bit over time. Um, we'll see. Um, <clears throat> but hopefully I'll be able to cover most of the important things. Um, but yeah, I asked you about the, um, I asked you all about which ones of the four categories we have left I should prioritize. Um, seems like you're focusing on physics and velocity and frame rate independence, um, and value ranges and interpolation, and then about equal on how to think about rotations and trajectories. I would say that um, the physics and velocity part of physics is more important than the trajectory math. Um, trajectory math is usually uh, something that you don't do very often unless you want to pre-calculate a trajectory. Um, quite often when you like do things with physics, uh, you have like, you're working with uh, discrete time, time steps rather than having a time value that gives you an absolute position and whatever. Um, so I think the physics part of it, of like how to do things in an update loop or a fixed update, that kind of stuff is really important. Um, okay, so I think trajectories is the least important one. Um, I'm trying to figure out like how to best segue into these topics, because some of these are kind of close to the stuff we've already done. Uh, so I might do... Uh, maybe we'll do the physics one first. So we can do physics first, and then we go into... <clears throat> I think the rotation part can be relatively short, um, and then we can do value ranges. And if we have time, we can go back to trajectories. Okay, yeah, I think trajectories is low prior. Yeah, the uh, interpolation part is really important. We need to make sure that we uh, get that one. Actually, let's do that one first. That one is the most important of those. Let's just do it. Uh, now the question is, do I give my talk that I gave on this topic, or do I do my own presentation now? I might just do the... Um, I'll not do the talk. My talk exists online if you want it. So I'm just going to go through, go through the concepts the way I usually do. Okay. So, uh, we have talked a lot about linear algebra. We talked about, uh, angles and positions and that kind of stuff, right? Um, now there's a very common concept whenever you are, uh, manipulating almost any kind of data, uh, where you have some data points. Here's a data point. Uh, let's say that this data point um, 
actually we don't we don't need to specify what this is we have some data point here we have some data point here uh, and then we want to um, get some values between these two data points okay so so what, what do i mean by data data points so uh, let's say this is the uh, the number uh, let's pick a number zero um, and the number 10. let's say you want the halfway point between these two numbers uh, so halfway point, generally, I think most people would know how to do that because uh, that's an average. So an average means we take all the values we have. In this case, we have two data points, 0 and 10. We add them together and then divide by 2. So we end up with a value 5. Uh, and this works even if we um, use other numbers. Let's say we use the value um, 10 and we use the value 30. Um, if we add these together and then divide it by 2, we get the halfway number, which in this case is 20, right? So this is a special case of what's called interpolation. Interpolation is when you have two data points, or any number of data points actually, but in this case two, and you want to get some data between these points. And this could be anywhere along this line. Uh, so generally, the way that you specify where along this line is usually a value that is called the t value. Uh, sometimes it means time, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, so t-value is generally uh, from 0 to 1. <clears throat> Let's give the t-value a color. We're gonna, green is going to be the t-value color. There we go. Um, so t is a value from 0 to 1. And if we want to be exactly halfway between these two numbers, uh, then t would be 0.5. Uh, so you can sort of think of t as a percentage from start to finish. Uh, so if t is 0.5, so t equals 0.5, then we have the exact midpoint here. So that's when t equals 0.5. Um, if you're here, for instance, halfway between the midpoint and the start point, uh, then that would be t equals 0. Um, 0.25. And you would have 0.75 here. And if it's exactly on the starting point, then t equals 0. And at the end point, t equals 1. Uh, so these are the different values we can have for, uh, for the t value. Uh, so what this is, is um, it doesn't really have a good name, which, which is kind of frustrating. Um, so usually, I call it like a normalized range. Uh, sometimes you can call it a fraction. Sometimes you can call it a uh, multiplier, depending on how it's used. Um, so this is what the... Um, how the t value works, regardless. You can set the t value uh, to uh, generally a number between 0 and 1, where 0 represents the starting value, 1 represents the ending value, and any values in between is going to blend this data. Uh, so, so if t is 0.5, the value we get out of um, the function we're talking about, which is called linear interpolation, or LERP for short, LERP. So the, that was a bad line. There we go. Um, so if we use the LERP, where we pass the value 10 and the value 30 in as our start and end values, and then we pass the t value of 0.5, that's the same thing as doing an average. Uh, so the LERP function will give us 20 here. Um, if we pass the t value 0.75, well, now it's going to be halfway between these values. Um, so uh, in this case, uh, as far as I know, that is 25. <laughs> um, and then if we do t equals 0.25, then we get halfway between these values, uh, which is 15, according to my calculations. Um, okay, so essentially what the LERP function looks like is that we have a starting point, usually called A, and an end point, usually called B, uh, and yes, the name LERP comes from linear interpolation. And then we have the t value. Then LERP is generally written as LERP between A, B, and then we have our t value. And you can think of A and B as start and end points. Um, okay, so what, what is this useful for? What's the point of this? Uh, the point of this is generally to, to map from one range to another or to blend between values that we already know. 
So, so in this case, we were doing a linear interpolation between the value of um, 10 and the value of 30, right? Uh, so if we now pass the uh, from a value in t that is between 0 and 1, we can blend between a and b. Um, so something that is really powerful about linear interpolation is that we can we can do this for almost any type of data. So that's why I said data points. I don't didn't want to be too specific. Um, sorry, I'm shuffling things around. I want this to look good when I send you the final image. <laughs> Okay, so in this case, we were interpolating numbers, um, but we can interpolate other things. Uh, so for instance, we can go up a few dimensions and let's say um, A and B are coordinates. Uh, so this time, maybe we have positions. We have one position here and we have another position all the way up here. Uh, and let's say this is our A and B points. Uh, we can still use linear interpolation to blend between these two positions. So if you want to make something move from position A to position B, then you use the line tool to draw this line. Uh, there we go. Uh, so if you want something to move from A to B, then you can animate the T value. So you have your starting point, A, you have your end point, B, and both of these could be vectors. Like this could be literally coordinates. Um, you would have the, um, like an X and a Y position, just like any other vector. And the same thing uh, goes for this point over here. And you can blend them. So if you lerp, then, and you animate the T value here, the T value going from zero all the way to one. Um, and if you place an object at the value that the lerp returns, you're gonna get the position between these two. Um, so if you do, um, so lerp between A and B, uh, where you have the T value here, maybe it's confusing to make it green, I don't know, hopefully not. Uh, actually, let, let's give it a specific value. So let's say we pass in a T value of um, 0 0.6, why did it? That's not a point. Um, so if it's 0 0.6, then we're gonna get a point that is 60% on the way from A to B. So we have 50% here. Um, so 60% is gonna be here somewhere. Uh, so this would be the point we get out of the LERP function. Uh, and again, because we're interpolating positions, the LERP function will also return a position. Um, so uh, this is, extremely useful anytime you want to blend between two states and this could be um, it doesn't have to be number it doesn't have to be position um, you can do this with colors so if you have uh, let's say we have a color <clears throat> over there that's one color another color over there let's say you want to lerp between these um, well if you have colors that you want to blend um, then halfway between these two uh, would be uh, this color <clears throat> and so forth. And you can you can blend between these two colors. So what you end up with when you lerp colors um, is that you get a gradient. So let's make a little gradient. All right, so if you, if you lerp colors instead of lerping um, positions or, or values, uh, you will get a gradient going from the starting color to the ending color, like so. Um, yeah, so, so this is something that uh, you use this all the time in shaders. Um, so if you are blending colors or blending directions or like almost anything can be interpolated using uh, LERP. So, <clears throat> so this is a really, really, really useful concept. So just to clarify in this case, here we got uh, LERP between this color and this color based on the T value. Guessing lerp is called something else in Shader Forge? Nope, it's called lerp. Okay, so all of these are using the same function called lerp, uh, linear interpolation. Uh, the um, something that you can use this for, or something you can also do, is what's generally mathematically is called extrapolation rather than interpolation, uh, is when you can give it a t value that is below zero or above one. What that means is that you can get values that go beyond the data points that you have. 
Uh, this is incidentally pretty useful in many cases. Uh, so sometimes you actually want to extrapolate beyond uh, the initial range that you have. Um, it's mostly useful for positions and data, not as useful for colors, but sometimes it can be. Um, because colors and extrapolation tend to be a little bit more unpredictable and it's not as intuitive as the other ones. Um, so in this case, if we were to do, uh, if we were to send negative 0.5 in here, the value range would continue uh, going backwards. Uh, so if we have negative 0.5, uh, then we would get um, a value of, um, let's see, negative 30, I believe we would get, no, sorry, um, zero would be at, 0.5 um, because at this step it changes by 10 so if we do another step of the same distance it would change by the same amount um, so negative um, negative 0.25 would give us a value of 5 and so forth so this is extrapolation when you go outside of the uh, data set that you have when would you use slurp? Lerp seems to be able to do everything. Um, slurp is a spherical linear interpolation. Uh, so the difference between slurp and lerp um, is that the spherical interpolation is more expensive, uh, but it's more correct, like mathematically. So if you have a, let's say we have a vector. We have a vector A and we have a vector b, and these are directions, so these are normalized. Um, so if you want to uh, lerp between these, uh, then again, you would do uh, lerp, and then you would pass a and b into this, and finally a t value for like percentage between them. Um, <clears throat> the vector you get out of this function uh, will lie along this line right here. So because the lerp is linear, that's kind of part of the name. It's always linear. It goes in a straight line. <clears throat> so what slurp does is that it rotates these rather than uh, linearly blending there. So if you use slurp instead, you would get an arc like this uh, rather than a straight line. <clears throat> um, so slurp is that one right there and lerp would be this one right there uh, so it kind of depends on like how uh, what you want to use it for so um, slurp is generally useful for directions uh, because lerp doesn't actually <clears throat> doesn't actually interpolate the direction linearly it just interpolates the position um, so slurp is something you use for directions and rotations uh, lerp is something you use for positions or data points that you just want to linearly interpolate. Um, in some cases, uh, lerp looks close enough. Um, and if lerp looks close enough, uh, use lerp because lerp is much cheaper. Uh, slurp is more expensive, but it's technically correct. Um, so for instance, if you want to uh, do rotations, then with slurp, um, you will get correct, correctly interpolated rotations, but they're more expensive. Uh, but if you lerp rotations, you quite often get a very similar result, uh, especially if the rotations are close to each other. Um, so, and that is much cheaper to do. Uh, so lerp is really useful for uh, like cheaper things, even with rotation. Um, but yeah, so, so sometimes you can get away with, um, if you use lerp to interpolate a direction, uh, you could use lerp and then normalize that vector. Uh, but even if you do that, that is actually not an angularly linear transformation. Um, so there is a difference between a normalized lerp and a slurp, um, which might be useful sometimes. So here's an animated version of the difference between lerp and slurp. So you can see that the slurp one interprets the data as a direction or a vector, and then it rotates that vector um, around uh, or the origin. Um, and here's the a comparison between the, uh, the difference between these two, where you can see that even if you normalize them, um, they wouldn't point in the same direction. So slurp is angularly linear. It makes it so that um, the 
incre increment in angle is consistent all across the interpolation, whereas with lerp that wouldn't be the case. So the, the bigger the angular difference, um, the, the more like beneficial it is to use slurp. Okay, so that's <clears throat> that's lerp versus slurp. What if you're handling values within the one dimension? Is slurp any difference from lerp then? In one dimension, slurp doesn't make any sense. Uh, there is no rotation in one dimension. Uh, so in one dimension, slurp just doesn't exist. Okay, cool. So here's lerp. Uh, do you want to see a like? Do you want to see an example of this, like in Unity? All right, lerp test. Okay, let's see. We need to create a starting point. What colors do we use? Uh, sort of red for the start. We were supposed to do only theory. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, endpoint. Uh, all right. So we have a start and an endpoint, and then we want to place some object between these two points. Uh, so let's make a transform st the, the, the start. I don't know how to type anywhere. There we go. Uh, and then we want some t value. So let's make a range from 0 to 1. Um, so this is just called t. Uh, that's it. Okay. And then we want our on draw gizmos function. Okay. Then we want to draw some sphere. Gizmos dot draw sphere. And we're going to draw this at the interpolated location. Uh, yes, range 01 is my own uh, macro in Writer. Um, okay, so now we need to calculate the position between the start point and the end point. Um, actually, we haven't assigned these in the editor yet, so let's do that before we get no reference thrown in our face. Oh, did I make them public? I did not. Okay, great. Good job, Freya. Wow, caps. Also good job. Right, start points, end points. There we go. And then we want to draw some points between these two. Uh, we can start by drawing the line. So let's do gizmos dot draw line from. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's define our, our positions first. Let's just do tf start um, or actually a. And b. So now we have the position A, the position B, and we have the T value up here. And then we're going to draw a line between these two, just to first visualize the range we're working in. So now there's a line between these two points, and we can move them around. Um, and then let's say we now want to interpolate a position between these two. Okay, so uh, let's get the, the point out of this. So the point uh, is vector 3 dot lerp and we want to lerp between a and b based on the t value so we got a point here and then we can draw a point so we can do gizmos dot draw sphere and point and then we give it some radius um probably too big there we go so now if we tweak this t value we now have a point that is moving between these coordinates uh, so now, basically what we've done is that we have a function where we can specify a value from 0 to 1, and then we can get any point between this starting point and this end point. So if we move this around, it doesn't really matter where these are, but we can still use a lerp to get a point between these two. Uh, so if you want to animate something from one position to another, uh, you could use lerp for that. And it doesn't matter where these points are, it would still always work the same. Um, yeah. So that's how you do a lerp. Um, and then if you want to like continue doing this in terms of, you know, how would you do this with color? Well, oh, we made this one green. That's, that's not good. Let's do blue instead. Um, so let's say we want to uh, blend the color instead. So then we do uh, color C equals, or we can just do gizmos.color equals color.lerp. And we want to blend between uh, red and blue, color.red, color.blue, based on the same t value. So now we're setting the gizmo color. And we can go back. And now it is colored based on where it is along the line. So now we're blending from red to blue. Uh, so this is kind of like 
this is like one of the really, really powerful things about Lerp in that uh, you can use it across space, you can use it across time, you can use it for color, and you can use it for so many different things. Um, so, so this is a very, very useful tool for almost anything uh, you want to use that has anything to do with like blending between any type of data, right? So yeah, what I Lerp, I often do with the current position update and I get a smoothing effect. Is there a way to get... Uh, what do you mean by step two or step three? Um, so using Lerp for smoothing, the thing that Jonathan Blow blocked me over uh, <laughs> is uh, that is a very like, um, it's a bit of a hack. Uh, it seems like there are, um, it seems like there are a lot of, uh, a lot of people that are familiar with Lerp specifically just from, from smoothing. Uh, but smoothing is, um, it's kind of a weird use case of the Lerp, uh, but essentially, uh, let's say you have some target. Let's use blue again for the target. Uh, and then you have your current position. So if you use Lerp in an update method where, where like every frame you apply a Lerp, then what that's going to mean is that um, generally you also have a constant in the T value. So it usually looks something like position equals Lerp. And then you pass the position itself as a starting point. And then you pass the end point here, end. And the t value is either constant or something multiplied by time dot delta time. Um, and here you would use the, um, you're talking about two separate things. Uh, but this is something that a lot of people do as well. So I don't know which one you're talking about. There are different ways of doing it. but. Previously, we talked about where the start and end point are fixed. But if you want to do something that people usually call lerp smoothing, uh, then you kind of assign back the result of the lerp to the starting position. Uh, so lerp smoothing, um, usually you have some value like 0.05 or something as a t value. So, so what does this mean? Uh, so if we want to interpret this in like English instead of uh, math, then what this means is move 0.05, that's 5%, closer to end every frame. This is what this code means. That is what this is saying. Uh, so, so what happens here is that, so, so if you imagine then, if we do this step by step, then if you get the next position, so we say 5%, okay, maybe that's here, and then 5% again, 5% again, and so forth. Uh, they're going to end up being more and more dense the closer we get. And eventually, it's going to start slowing down. Um, so if we use uh, the bigger value, something like 0.5, for instance, the first frame is going to jump all the way here. Second frame, it's going to go here. Third frame, it goes here. Fourth frame, it goes here. You can see that it's always halfway between uh, the previous point and the current point. Um, so this is why Lerp smoothing uh, slows down when you get close to a target, um, because you you are always moving a percentage of the current distance, um, and that just kind of naturally makes it move slower. Um, there are a lot of caveats with the way that this works. Uh, the one of the problems is that this is not frame rate independent. Uh, so usually. There's a hack you can do where you can make this one relative to time dot delta time. So if you multiply this by time dot delta time, uh, then you will not get something that is actually uh, frame rate independent, um, but it's very close to. So practically, it doesn't matter. Uh, if you multiply this by time dot delta time, tweak the value to something that's useful, and then you can get it to look good generally across most frame rates. Um, yeah, this is what Jonathan Blow got got mad at me about because I said that this was useful, and Jonathan Blow responded with a huge long thing about how I don't know anything about multi-platform development and how frame rate differs on different platforms and that this is actually not fully consistent and you should use the RK4 instead. It's like ah. <laughs> anyway, that was what he got got angry at me about, and then I got angry at him. Um, anyway, uh, so that's Lerp smoothing. Uh, that's that's kind of useful uh, if you want to like have a quick and dirty way of making something slow down as it's moving to a target. Another good like another advantage of doing this one uh, is that if you have a moving target, like let's say blue is moving, let's say blue is moving upwards, then you're gonna have something that can kind of smoothly follow that target, and then it would sort of move smoothly uh, toward 
the new position. Um, so, so it's really, really useful whenever you want to do something simple, like you smooth towards some position. Um, usually I use it for stuff that's mostly visual. Uh, I very rarely use this for stuff that affects gameplay. So it's mostly if I want to do something visually smooth or whatever. Okay, um, so that's lerp smoothing. Wait, what would you use to make smoothing? Like with lerp smoothing, minus the slowing down? What do you mean by minus, minus the slowing down? Oh, to move toward a point or... Um, so moving toward a point is more about um, doing the vector math about like um, you you find the direction to the next point and you have a fixed speed and then you limit the length of the velocity vector to uh, be below a certain speed if you want like a linear uh, movement. Do you know if smooth damp uses this or slurp? Uh, slurp is more of an exception. What if you added in a coroutine and not an update with fixed time? Will this be FPS independent? It depends on what your coroutine passes by. Um, you can make your coroutine update every nth second, or you can use a, um, like, or you can make sure that you're using the fixed frame rate or whatever. Like, yeah, it kind of depends on, on the use case. Um, okay. Just realized that color lerp is gradient between two colors. Yes. Let's see. I'm trying to figure out how to, um, what best to approach the next one. We're going to get into more frame rate independent stuff and velocity and that kind of stuff later. Um, but we have more to talk about when it comes to range remapping. Um, so I'm trying to figure out what example would be good to bring up. Oh, we actually haven't talked about how to write lerp. Lerp is a surprisingly simple function. Uh, so let's do that. Uh, lerp between A and B and T. So lerp ABT, if you want to write this mathematically, um, that would be, there are kind of two ways of doing it. I'm going to show you the numerically stable one. Um, so we can either do, uh, or actually first for A, we would do um, 1 minus T multiplied by A plus, why is my, why are my colors darker? Plus B multiplied by T. And that's it. That, that's, a, that, that's all lerp is. Um, this one does not clamp the values. Uh, this one makes sure, like, lets you extrapolate as well. So if, if t is uh, outside of 0 to 1, uh, you would be able to go outside of the, the range of a to b. Um, but yeah, otherwise this is the kind of the, the very simple, um, uh, yeah, the very, very simple lerp equation. It's a convex combination. Yes, it's a, it's a weighted blend, uh, essentially. Uh, so, so what this means is that uh, this is a value from 0 to 1, this is a value from 0 to 1, uh, but this one is inverted. Um, but if you look at these values on a graph, you can sort of think of it as a weight for how much influence each point should have. So if you have a, a range from 0 to 1, um, and you want to see how much influence does A have as we increase T. So on the x-axis we have T, uh, and then on the y-axis we have the influence of each. Uh, so the influence of the A data point would decrease, so it starts out being at maximum value. Uh, so at 1, only the A point affects the outcome. But as you increase uh, the T value, the influence of the uh, B value increases. Uh, so this is how it works. This is a weighted average, uh, because the sum of the influence of the red one plus the blue one is always 1. So it's, a, it's sometimes that's called a weighted sum. Wait, did one of the students do cat ears? <laughs> if it's not a student, I would probably ignore it. But if it's a student, I kind of have to do it. I'm obliged to. Yeah. There you go. You did it. You happy now? We've been trying to save up for the last day. <laughs> well, you did it. Congrats. You finished the math course. This is what it all led up to. Cool. So that's lerp. Let's see. Uh, the next thing that um, I, I, I'm like trying to stop myself from bringing up examples that are like shader related because like most of the things in my head are just shaders. <laughs> um, so I don't know if that's going to be more confusing than useful, but now we're done with lerp. Let's move on to the next one. The next one um, is a little bit more esoteric. The, the next one is something that um, the is rarely talked about, which I think is really strange because it's extremely useful. And a lot of people uh, use this type of math, but they do the math manually rather than use the function itself. Uh, so we've talked about lerp, but there's another function called inverse lerp. So inverse, I don't know how to, how to write letters today. 
inverse lerp. There we go. So inverse lerp is sort of like in like in sort of the opposite of a lerp. So remember how we had lerp uh, between a and b. Yes, I talk about this in my talk that was linked in chat. So we have a, b, and t, and that gives us some uh, data point, right? Uh, so as a generic catch-all term, uh, I'm going to call that uh, v for value. So we get some sort of value out of this function, right? Okay, inverse lerp um, is very similar, but it flips these last two arguments. So instead, we get a t value and we pass a value into it. All right. So, so you might ask, like, what's the what's the practical use case of this? Um, how does this matter? Okay, so here's a, here's a simple example. Let's say you have an audio source. Let's let's try a little audio. There you go. So there's an audio source here, and you have some sort of player. Here we go. That's a player. I'm trying to make sure I get all my colors right. So you have an audio source and you have a player. Um, and you want the audio source to um, be at some volume when you're at some distance away from this audio source. Uh, so if you consider the axis here, or just the, the distance to the audio source, um, then maybe you have some value here at like five meters. You want, you want to say that at five meters, you want maximum volume. Okay, five meters max volume. All right, but then you also want to say that at um, here, when you are uh, 15 meters away, you want it to be inaudible. You want it to be silent, right? So how would you solve this problem? Um, because now you, because um, you have the distance that the player has to the audio source, right? Um, Okay, so if you want to do this, then the inverse lerp is sort of the perfect candidate for solving this problem. Uh, so when, when you now have the distance here, let's call it v, because we're going to use this as the value function. Uh, we have v, we have an a and a b point as well. So, but keep in mind that um, we can sort of rephrase this into terms that make a bit more sense. So uh, with lerp, we were sort of saying that, okay, we have a start point, we have an end point, and then we have a percentage between those two points. And then, then out of this, we get a value between those two data points. Okay, inverse lerp. What does inverse lerp mean? Inverse lerp means that we have a starting point and an end point and a point between those two points. And what we get out of it is the percentage of where you are between those two points or fraction or value from zero to one. Okay, so how would we apply that here? Well, <clears throat> we want to we want to have a percentage. Max volume, we can interpret that as one, and silent, we can interpret that as zero. So if we use inverse lerp here, then we would essentially say that, uh, let's write it as i lerp. Uh, a good thing to keep in mind when you're using inverse lerp, um, <clears throat> keep in mind that the first value uh, is when you want it to be zero. In this case, that would be 15, right? So this is going to be our start value, and this is going to be our end value. So we're going to do inverse lerp with 15 and 5. And then the value we pass into this is going to be the distance between uh, the player and the audio source. Uh, so we could call it distance, or we could call it v. Let's call it distance. There you go. Okay, so what we're going to get out of this now is a value from 0 to 1, where if the player is all the way over here, we're going to have a value of 0 when you're at 15 meters away. And then the value is going to increase the closer we get all the way up to 1. Uh, and, and this whole range in between, it's going to be blended because it's it's interpolation, right? It's going to be 0.5 in the center and so forth. Um, now, someone asked if inverse lerp is clamped or not. In Unity, it's sort of inconsistent. Um, the 
uh, most of Unity's C Sharp functions are all clamped by default. They have unclamped alternatives. Uh, in shaders, Lerp, uh, Lerp is unclamped by default. Uh, so it kind of depends on the context. Um, but generally, Unity's functions are clamped unless they say unclamped. Um, so if they're clamped, it means that if the player is here, the, player is, uh, the volume is going to be stuck at 1. It's never going to go above 1. Uh, same thing if you're over here. Uh, the volume is going to be stuck at 0, no matter how far away you are. Uh, but if, you, if it's uh, allowed to extrapolate, uh, the volume is going to keep increasing over here. So now you're gonna, if you go even closer, volume is going to go above uh, 1 to like 1.2 and so forth, and it's going to be louder and louder. Um, conversely, if you keep moving away from the audio source, uh, you're going to get negative audio levels, um, like whatever that means. Um, yeah, so, so you can get like negative values down there. Okay, did that make sense? Inverse Lerp is like super useful. It might take a while to like wrap your head around it, um, but yeah, ears implode, yes. Maybe it reverses the face of the audio. Uh, so, so quite often, um, if you've never heard of inver Inverse Lerp, but you've been working with games for a long time, you usually just do the math yourself. And that usually takes a lot of time because <laughs> you're, you're like, oh, um, how do I, okay, so if I want to do this, do this manually, I need to get like the the distance from the, the the minimum value to the player, but I also need to divide it by the distance between these two in order to normalize it to the range, and then like it's it's a whole process. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, so quite often uh, that's a uh, a very useful function. Doesn't seem to be an inverse lerp unclamped weirdly enough. Yeah, it is weird. I don't like Unity's math library. Have I told you about my math library? Um, I have a math library for Unity that you can use. Uh, that is more consistent and good. Um, <laughs> feel free to use that one. Uh, inverse Lerp can also be useful for fading out objects based on distance from the camera. Yeah, for instance. Yeah, any any time. So so usually in in a very like high level, um, if you have some range of values and you want to say uh, that you want to take some interval of this range and remap it to zero to one, uh, or uh, like in the other way around, uh, like whatever this range may be, uh, which is what we're doing here. We want to remap the range of 15 to 5 to uh, 0 to 1. Uh, so, so whenever you're using inverse Lerp, it gives you the t value, which is generally between 0 and 1, unless you extrapolate. Oh, we didn't talk about how you write the inverse Lerp mathematically. Um, so in case you're curious, this is how you would do it. So you have A, B, V. I need to get a better yellow. I don't like this yellow. Okay, so the way to do an inverse Lerp is to do V minus A um, divided by B minus A. Uh, so what this means is essentially um, First, we make v relative to a, so uh, this makes v relative to a, and then we scale uh, that value by the distance between uh, b and a. Uh, that's sort of a, a more geometric interpretation of this one. So it's sort of like a normalization thing. Um, yeah, that's the math behind inverse Lerp. It is a it is a pretty cheap function. Both of these are very cheap in general, uh, but one thing to keep in mind. Like I mentioned before, every time you have a division thing, try to think of what happens if the um, denominator is zero, uh, because that is something that can happen. And usually, whenever you have a mathematical function where you can get a division by zero, like I mentioned before, it's sort of like math is talking back to you and saying like, hey, this thing might get fucky and you need to figure out why it's fucky and what you want to do when this happens uh, because this is undefined it, it you just cannot calculate it mathematically um, so what does that mean in an inverse lerp well in an inverse lerp if a and b are at the same location uh, then this is zero that's the only case when this is zero uh, so if they are at the same location and then we're given a value here the answer to the question of what inverse Lerp is, is what percentage of blending between these two gives you this position? 
uh, and the answer doesn't exist, right? It, there's, there is no way to do that. Um, so whenever you're doing an inverse LERP, and it's possible for A and B to be very close to each other, uh, you might have to do some special case handling for when they are close to each other. Well, oh, whereas for, for LERP, uh, if A and B have the exact same position, it doesn't matter, right? Uh, whatever value we're passing into T, um, we're always going to get the same position because the result is the same. Um, so it's not a problem for LERP because there's no division by zero here. Um, we just um, we just get either of these two. They have the same value, uh, so it doesn't matter what weights we apply to them. Then we have the third one. The third one is a uh, sort of a combination between these two. Uh, I don't know. Do you want to see like a, an example in Unity or should we move on? I want to see an example. Okay. Oh, I didn't have to delete those two. Um, uh, okay, let, let's let's make these. Uh, let's use the. Um, let's do the example we talked about, like the audio volume thing, and let's visualize things. So, uh, so we might have some uh, inner radius, right? The radius at which we want max volume, All right? And then we do the same thing for outer radius. Thoris within five meters, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, as usual, it's really good to visualize these things. Um, oh, we also need the, the player position. Let's call it player. Actually, we can just use the this transform as the player. So. to give their attention during our break. <laughs> uh, Vega 3.up as the normal... Okay, radius. Uh, so now we're gonna just visualize the inner and outer radius. Uh, so we're just gonna do the same thing for both of them. And then we go back to Unity. There we go. Hello, Thor. Don't step on my keyboard. Hey, 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 hey. No, Thor has had food in his bowl all this time. <laughs> so he is not starving. <laughs> do not worry about that. What is precision mode and how do I get out of it? Wake on. I don't like it. Thor, how did you do this even? <laughs> oh my god. Okay, Thor. This this boy. Okay. You got your attention. Do you wanna move somewhere else? You're a little you're a little bit you're a little bit disruptive, Thor. Buddy? No, that's Okay, there we go. We're gonna have Thor cam for a bit. Uh okay. Uh, but anyway, I don't need to use the tablet right now anyway, because we're doing code. Um, so we have the inner radius. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me, by the way. Hopefully you're fine. Um, we have the inner radius. We have the outer radius. <laughs> Thor is looking at my... <laughs> Thor is looking at my cursor. Um, and then we have the player position here. So let's, uh, let's draw a little thing there. Draw dot... Um, draw sphere. At the player position. <laughs> Thor is... Thor is quality content. He's a little bit annoying, but you know what? <laughs> it's okay. Okay, so now we're drawing a little sphere where the player is. <clears throat> uh, but we want to know the distance to the player. So float dist to player equals vector uh, three dot distance. <clears throat> uh, player position to uh, center, which is currently just vector 3.0. Because uh, this is a it's just at zero at all times. Um, you're missing out on this example because you're all looking at Thor. But you know what? You know what? Cats are valid too. Um, okay. Uh, so now we have the distance to the player. And now what we want to do is we want to set the audio volume based on how close you are to this audio source. <clears throat> um, so let's do that. Float uh, volume equals, uh, and here's where we're going to use inverse lerp. So math dot inverse lerp. Uh, this one is clamped by default. <clears throat> um, so <coughs> we want to start with the value where we want it to be zero. 
uh, which is outer radius in this case, because we want it to be completely silent when you're too far away. And then when we're getting closer, we want it to be louder. Um, <laughs> yeah, Thor is just hanging out, I guess. Um, okay, so we have the audio volume now. <clears throat> and I don't know how we're how we should visualize this. Maybe drawing a line up from the player or something. Um, so let's do draw. No, that's using shapes. Uh, gizmos. Draw a line. <clears throat> um, at the player position, and then from player position, um, plus vector three dot up times volume. There we go. So now we're visualizing the volume with a line going up from the player. Okay, so we now move the player. Uh, you can see that there's a vertical line here. So that line represents the audio volume. And then it shrinks once we go outside of this range. Um, so this is what inverse lerp can be used for. Uh, you have some values that are within some range. And the same thing for the... Um, the player position is also within, uh, in this case, it's meters, right? The position or the distance for the player is in meters. The inner and outer radius are also both in meters. Uh, and then from that, you now get a volume um, using inverse lerp. And it's a value between zero and one. And Thor is currently, has, Thor has some thoughts about this, this object. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's a practical example. <laughs> how this works. Thanks, Thor. Okay, that's it. Uh, we're going for a break. Uh, wouldn't inverse lerp be useful as well for things like grenade damage? Yes, absolutely. Um, short break. Okay, you better keep the ears. Yes, I mean, you you spent the your hard-earned Freya bucks on it, so... Um, so, uh, just to like clarify this a little more, we can visualize the, the value we got out of this. Um, let's call it volume. look at this again. Uh, the bottom slider here is the volume of the audio source. Um, so if I'm moving, if I'm far away from the audio source, it's now zero, right? If you move closer, you can see that it starts increasing now. Halfway between these points, it's at 0.5. And now it's increasing all the way up to one, and then it stops, because now I'm within the inner radius. Um, so this is using inverse lerp with the uh, outer radius and the inner radius as values and the uh, distance to the player as the the v parameter of the inverse lerp. Um, so that's it. That's all we're using here. It's the same example as this. And like I mentioned, Unity's math inverse lerp clamps by default. My math library does not. So kind of depends on which ones you're... Um, yeah, kind of depends on what, what you want to use it for. Here's another use case. If you have ever used the levels tool in Photoshop to do photo adjustments, then you have used uh, inverse lerp, most certainly, um, and you might have used lerp as well. So if you have a photo, let's say you took a picture of Thor lying down on a paper bag because he thought the bag was great, uh, but you feel like the, the photo looks a little washed out, like maybe you want to add some more contrast to it or something, um, then when you do levels adjustment, these these two knobs, this one and this one, they are literally doing inverse lerp on the color data, um, where you can modify what is the maximum and what is the minimum values and where those thresholds should be. So if you want to increase contrast, um, you can tweak these two values. And that's literally inverse lerp. Uh, and then you can do the same thing with lerp. These bottom two values are... Um, is, are essentially doing a lerp. Usually that makes your image more washed out though. So most people uh, only use these when tweaking photos. Um, but yeah, so, so literally you have inverse lerp and lerp in Photoshop right here uh, when tweaking levels. Yeah, all right. Now let's talk about the, the final one, the master function of both of the, the functions to, to rule them all or something like that. All right, we talked about lerp talked about inverse lerp. Now, with their powers combined, you get a function called remap. There we go. With lerp, we are pretty much going from a 0 to 1 value uh, into some other value range uh, within A and B, right? 
All right. Uh, with inverse lerp, it's sort of the other way around. Uh, with inverse lerp, we're giving it a value in the range of a to b, and then we get a value <clears throat> from 0 to 1 out of it. Um, so these two are kind of flipped, right? OK, so if we now think of what if we don't want to use 0 to 1? What if we don't care about a value from 0 to 1? What if we want to map from one range to another range? And that's where um, <clears throat> that's where remap comes into the picture. OK, so how does remap work? Well, remap is, is pretty much a combined version uh, of lerp and inverse lerp. Uh, so with remap, it has an input minimum value. Uh, it has an input maximum value. It has an output minimum value and an output maximum value. There we go. Not entirely sure what colors we should use for this because we're running out of colors. Um, and then a value. There we go. So remap is a combination of these two functions where you have an input range and an output range. OK, for consistency, this is making me a little sad. I need to, I need to fix this. So what essentially is happening here is that this is a combination of inverse lerp and lerp where it's doing an inverse lerp using these values um, and v. And then you get a t value out of that. So this is essentially the same as doing, um, let's see, we used green for the t value. So t equals lerp between uh, these two values. So we're lerping. Um, no, sorry, inverse lerp. Um, excuse me. Inverse lerp. It's a very short L. So inverse lerp between imin, imax, and v. That gives us a t value. Because again, inverse lerp spits out a value between 0 and 1, unless you extrapolate. And then, using this t value, we are then returning the lerped value between omin and omax using t. Oh god, did not mean to copy all of that. All right, uh, and then the final value is lerp between the output min and the output max based on the t value. So dude, output min, output max. So that's what we're returning with the remap function. And this is this is remap. This is the uh, the whole thing. Um, where t is kind of automatically calculated, and then it returns a, another range that we provided. Um, OK, so that's all well and good, but what's the, what's the use case for this? Um, all right, so <laughs> just as you ask for a use case. <laughs> all right, let's say we go back to this example. This is now, it's now going to turn violent. Are you ready? This is no longer an audio source. This is the one and only infamous explosive barrel. Oh, geez, things got dangerous now. All right, so we've got our explosive barrel where we cut off the outline, which is not great. There we go. Explosive barrel. <clears throat> um, so let's say now, instead of controlling audio volume, you want to control how much damage this um, this one uh, is going to do. So if you now think about this, then maybe you want to say uh, when the player is here, outside of this range, um, there should be zero damage, right? But then you want the damage to ramp up the closer you get to it. And then maximum damage should be at five meters. Uh, so maximum damage, maybe uh, you want that to be, uh, I don't know, 200. Let's say that that's your maximum damage. OK. This is a neat use case for remap, uh, because again, uh, we are now essentially, um, we want to blend between zero damage to 200 damage um, based on this interval, depending on the player position. Um, so this is a use case for remap. So how would we write this remap? Well, 
uh, input range, consider what type of range the uh, the player is working in. The player is working in meters, right? Uh, so uh, we want the meters as the input range. So okay, so our input range is uh, we want it to be zero at 15 meters. So start with 15, and then we want it to be 200 at five meters. Uh, so then the next parameter is five. And then the final one is, uh, or sorry, not the final one. Then we need the output range. Uh, the output range that we want is from zero damage at 15 meters. And then we want 200 damage at five meters. And then finally, we need to pass the, the player uh, distance as the last parameter. So that's the distance. So now this one function is pretty much doing everything we want it to do uh, to give us this range right here. Can't you just multiply the t value when you've used inverse slurp with a 200? Yes, you can. In this specific case, you can, uh, but not in every case. So the, the case where you wouldn't be able to do that is if this is not zero. Um, so if you multiply it, that presumes that you want zero. Um, but there are other cases where uh, you don't want this to be zero. Um, yeah. Like you could have a use case where maybe you want to, uh, maybe you want this value to be um, like 20 damage. Uh, let's say that's what you want, but you don't really care like what where zero damage is. You just want to know that you have 20 damage at 15 meters and 200 damage at five meters. Then you could let extrapolation just land somewhere wherever the zero damage uh, threshold would be. Um, but yeah, so remap does not exist in Unity's math library. Um, but I actually, I have a math library that I use quite a lot. Uh, I'm going to send you a link. It's, it's pretty useful whenever you're doing these types of mathematical functions that actually does have a remap function uh, built into it. So that's pretty useful. Okay. Uh, so if you, uh, let's see, um, another use case. Uh, this one is a little wonky because generally you wouldn't have the remap in one function. Uh, but let's say you have a, a health bar. There you go. Uh, and you go from zero health to, I don't know, 400. There you go. That's a health bar. Uh, let's say you want to uh, set the color of this health bar depending on how much health you have. Uh, so if you, if you don't have a lot of health, maybe you want to make sure that it's set to uh, be red when you don't have a lot of health. Um, but when you do have a lot of health, maybe you want it to be green. So if you have a lot of health, you want this to be a healthy, freshly cut health bar. There you go. So, so now you've sort of got a similar case of what if you want to blend between these two colors? Uh, maybe you want to halfway blend when, you're, when your health is somewhere in between. Um, so what you can then do is use an inverse lerp for that um, to first get the T value. Um, so maybe you have some threshold here of like, um, when you are at, uh, 40 health or below, that's when you want it to be red. Uh, when you are at, um, 200 health or above, you want it to be green. Um, okay. So, and then you want the colors themselves and then you need your current health. So essentially what this is, um, is a, again, it's a remap. So it's a remap where uh, when your health is, uh, you have the input range of the health, which is 40 to 200. And then you have the color range, which is in this case, a color. So there's a little bit of a weird remap function that has mixed types, uh, but your output range is in, is a color, right? And then you want the current health. Um, so health would be here. So this is essentially what you would then do. You would color the health bar based on this function. Uh, now, obviously again, remap functions generally don't mix like float values and colors. Um, so you would generally first use an inverse lerp with this, this, and this, and then you would use a color lerp using uh, these two colors and based on the T value you get out of the inverse lerp. Um, but you get the idea. You kind of remap one range to another range. So you can then blend the colors in between. Hope that made sense. I feel like these are leaking into each other. Okay. Any questions about that before we move on? Does this canvas have everything we've gone through? Um, I think so. Some of the layers are hidden. Um, I could make a version of this where I display all the hidden layers too. Um, yeah, I think there were some of them where I just hid layers instead of um, drawing next, next to them, but 
yeah, we're running out of time. There's still stuff that I want to go through. I'm going to I'm going to go through them regardless. And we're going to go over time as long as that's OK with y'all, uh, because we don't have I wouldn't be able to go through the rest um, with the given time. Uh, okay, I might make some of the explanations shorter still. Blending images using Lerp. Um, oh yeah, when you're using alpha blending, uh, that is literally using Lerp. And uh, if you're rendering something like a sprite or a texture, let's say you have something you're drawing on top of something else in a game, um, the alpha of this sprite or whatever it is, um, on the GPU, it is literally doing a Lerp with the background color and the current color of this object. Um, so. Yeah, it's used in many, many different places. So in this case, it's a color LARP. Buddy, what are you doing even? Why are you clawing at the tablet? Hey, this thing is expensive. Don't, don't insert claws in the tablet. Hey, no, buddy. Why are you? No, 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 no. Biting cables is illegal. That is very illegal. I'm going to lift you in your neck if you do that again. Why is he fascinated by cables all of a sudden? Are you done? <laughs> Okay, there you go. Now we can start screaming again. We talked about Lerp, inverse Lerp, remap. Right, we're gonna talk a little bit about Bezier curves. Um, I'm probably gonna run over this pretty quickly. I'm also gonna mention this as a pretty cool like feature of the Lerp, um, or one of the ways you can define Bezier curves is using the Lerp. Um, so here's something pretty cool. So you know when you are in uh, applications like Photoshop, let's say you are uh, using the pen tool, then you can usually do stuff like this, where you have these control points that you can manipulate, um, and then you can sort of like draw a line along these curves, right? These are using what's called the cubic Bezier curve. So uh, what are Bezier curves? Uh, generally, when talking about Bezier curves, there are many different types of Bezier curves, uh, but the most simple one, uh, the most simple one is a LERP, so we're not going to talk about that one. Uh, the next most simple one is called a, a quadratic Bezier curve. So a quadratic Bezier curve works like this. You essentially have uh, three points in a quadratic Bezier curve. So three points right there. Uh, and they're sort of in order. So you can sort of imagine them being connected uh, like this. Okay, so we got, we got our three points. We got a starting point. We got a midpoint and an end point. Um, Let's call these, um, you know, P0. Why is this? P is an annoying letter. I don't like P. Okay, P0, P1, and P2. Okay, so here's something fascinating that kind of happens when you start nesting LERPs. Uh, so if you start, let's say we, um, we have a LERP function that uh, where we use the, the t value of um, 0.25. Okay, so let's use the t value um, when lerping between p0 and p1. Okay, so 0.25 means that we're 25% along the way from p0 to p1. Uh, so that means that we're going to get a point that is somewhere here, right? Okay, then here's the like crucial part, we do the same thing for these two points from P1 to P2. So 25% along the way from P1 to P2 gives us that point. So what you might notice now is that you can sort of form a line between these two points. What we can then do is we do another lerp between these two. Let's call them uh, A and B. And then we'll lerp between these uh, at 25% and that gives us this point. So this is a very simple construction of a Bezier curve because if we change this value from 0 to 1, this blue point is going to trace this curve. And that is kind of the beauty of Bezier curves. They are extremely simple. Once you know how LERP works, um, it's just a set of nested LERPs. And then from that, you get this very like beautifully uh, clean and simple curve uh, from such a simple concept as just nesting your LERPs, like doing LERPs between all the data points until you run out of things to LERP essentially. Um, yeah, so this works for any value. If we set t to uh, 0.75, then we would get like this value, this value, 
get a line here, and then we would get this value right there. So see, this is how you can then construct a Bezier curve. So this is a quadratic Bezier curve. Uh, then we have the cubic Bezier curve, which is the most common one in image manipulation. So as soon as you move up one more step, you get one more point. Uh, so we have um, P0, P1, P2, P3. Could this be used for calculating grenade arcs and whatnot? Generally, you would use like real trajectories for that rather than Bezier curves. Um, but yes, sort of. All right, so now we have a connected chain of four points. And now this one is matching what we had in Photoshop, uh, where we sort of had a start point and an end point, And then we had control points here. Um, so let's do the same thing here, where we pick a 25% point on the way between P0 and P1. 25% on the way between P1, P2, 25% from P2 to P3, and we end up with uh, these two lines. Uh, and then we can just keep nesting this. We do the next lerp. Um, so now we have three points, which is what we had here as well. We had uh, one, two, three points. Um, so Bezier curves in and of themselves contain nested Bezier curves. Um, so this is a quadratic Bezier curve right here. Um, Okay, but then we do 25% here, 25% on that line, and then we end up with this line, and then we do 25% along that line, and then we have this yellow point. This yellow point is going to trace an arc that passes through the start and the end point with some neat curvature, something like this. Um, yeah, so, so that's how that's how Bezier works. Ballistic trajectories are parabolas. Uh, Bezier curves are not parabolas. Cubic, uh, quadratic Bezier curves are actually parabolas, um, but uh, cubic ones are generally not. Uh, but it's still kind of more, like it's easier to just do the um, calculation yourself for trajectories rather than using Bezier curves uh, when you're doing like actual trajectory math. Um, okay, anyway, so this is how LERPs work. Um, I think that is kind of beautiful. Um, and it still works just the same way with the t-value. It's 0 over here, 1 over here, uh, 0 0.5 in the middle, and so forth. Um, that's pretty cool. What do we use such curves for? Um, so these curves are used primarily in animation. Uh, so quite often if you're making animations for something or a camera movement along some track, um, or you're like making a road, or you're making a... Uh, like a train track. You want to make those trains bend based on these curves. Um, so like if you take a game such as City Skylines, where you can kind of place your own roads, right? Um, you can uh, select a starting point, and you have a road, and then you can select an end point, and then it sort of constructs a road along a curve. And then you can sort of keep curving it in whatever way you want. Um, yeah, and then uh, camera movement is very, very, very common for um, using Bezier curves for. Um, but yeah, and anytime you want to animate something along some path, or you want to generate something along a path, um, or yeah, anything like that. Um, so in image manipulation, you move P1 and P2 to change the arc. You also move, um, yeah, to change the shape of that one, yeah. So, so I mean, we could like literally do that now, and we can see how badly fit my Bezier arc was. So if I can draw a line from there to there. There we go. Now we have the the full Bezier curve. We place the anchor points exactly where I put them. You can see that we can reshape this one. And then we match the anchor points, something like that. Um, yeah, that's it. Can you just quickly recreate City Skyline to show an example? Uh, almost. Uh, I mean, I used this in Flowstorm. Um, I hope the editor isn't broken. I still have my hard dependency on Steam. The game literally gets exceptions or throws exceptions if you start the game without Steam running. There you go. Um, so in Flowstorm, uh, you create levels in the level editor, uh, and you can do that with Bezier curves. Um, so yeah, this level editor is using uh, cubic Bezier curves for doing all of these shapes. Um, and then you can manipulate, manipulate them afterwards, you can play on them, and so forth. But yeah, so, so that's 
That's Bezier curves. Uh, usually, if you want to make them continuous, you would make the control points match each other uh, so that they have the same tangent direction. Um, so even if I move just this control point, generally, you also move the other one. Um, in my case, I also made it so you can like break the tangents if you want to, if you want to make like sharper uh, shapes and whatnot, which was a lot of work, by the way. Holy shit, that was complicated. Uh, <laughs> so that's how... That's how, how you can use Bezier curves. Um, and and these are uh, 3D meshes as well. Uh, so uh, they're procedurally generated geometry um, along the Bezier curves. Uh, so the Bezier curves themselves, just a mathematical concept of it, uh, is only used to get the data required to generate these. Um, <clears throat> um, and then the obviously you can do a lot of like extra stuff on top of that. So um, you know, not only do you want to get a point, but maybe you want to get a normal of the curve as well. Like, what is the normal direction of this curve? Um, maybe you're wondering, what is the tangent direction of this curve? Um, and so forth. So, so these are all things you can calculate uh, with Bezier curves. And obviously, I needed that because I need to generate a mesh. Uh, so I need the directions out of the uh, Bezier curve as well. Um, yeah. Uh, so that's a use case for Bezier curves. And then City Skylines is another good example. Um, any editors where you place roads, usually mostly present in level editors rather than in-game though, but um, yeah, let's see. That was a quick notes about the Bezier curve. There, I, there's so much more interesting stuff about the Bezier curves, but we don't have the time to talk about it. <laughs> anyway, I can link you a few things on Bezier curves if you want to take a deep dive into them. Um, so this is the... There are also ways of optimizing them uh, where you don't actually use lerps anymore. Because um, if you take all the math involved in doing these lerps, if you just write that massive equation, you can actually make the uh, the code run faster. Um, here's my old blog post on Bezier curves because they are good. Um, so here's here's the link in case you want to take a deep dive into Bezier curves. Um, here's the um, the full equation of the go away group. No. Um, here's the full equation uh, where you have, uh, you take all the lerps of a cubic Bezier curve, you mash them together, and then you get this really long and terrible formula, uh, but you can sort of rewrite it into this. Um, and this is kind of readable. You can see that it's, um, you have the t value here, uh, you have the p0, p1, p2, like all the points are there. Um, and you can see that all of these refer to p0, all of these refer to P1, all of these refer to P2, and this is P3. Uh, so what these essentially are is that these are three polynomial equations. And remember how we talked about how um, with LERP, you could sort of visualize the influence that each vertex has uh, using these curves. You can do that with, with Bezier curves too. Uh, with a Bezier curve, uh, you have four points. And if you visualize these equations, um, you would get something like uh, this for the first point, uh, this for the second point, sort of a hump, and then it, it drops down. And for the second last point, you get a hump at the end like this. And for the very last point, there's another ramp like this. So this is sort of how those equations look. Um, so that's kind of the, the cheaper way of calculating the Bezier curve. Um, although when visualizing it, it doesn't really make as much sense because they're just weighted sums. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't look as pretty as the, um, the uh, LERP interpolation of it, but it's faster. So if you want a less precise but faster version of calculating it, um, you, can, you can use those equations if you want to. Um, so I think they're, um, yeah, these, these, uh, four, um, these four are the weights of each of these points. Okay. The next most important thing that we should talk about is, uh, physics, I think. So now we're going to sort of go back to, uh, sort of go back to the very basics of the first stuff we went through, uh, in terms of, uh, vectors and axes. So remember how, uh, remember how we had, a coordinate system, just like this. And in it, we could have vectors to represent some position, right? So maybe we have some position here, bad example. Um, maybe some position here where we have the x-coordinate of one, uh, y-coordinate of uh, two, 
and then this makes up a, a coordinate, right? We've mostly used this for positions so far and directions, um, but vectors, it, they're all kind of like a general concept you can use for many different things. Um, so very specifically, you do use this within physics as well. Uh, so let's say you have, um, let's say you have an object, and this object is moving through the world. Um, let's say it's in space. It is just in space. There's no gravity uh, anywhere. So it is just moving in a specific direction at a specific speed. Um, so the way that this is usually represented is using a so-called velocity vector. Uh, so a velocity vector, velocity uh, vector, Okay, so velocity vector is represented using, well, a vector, um, and the, let's call it V. Okay, so what this represents is how far it's going to move and in what direction per second. That's what this says. Uh, so if you have this cube, then this vector tells you um, where this is going to be in one second if it were to move at the exact same speed, as in, as in no, nothing is changing. It's moving at the same speed, same velocity, and it ends up at this place in one second. Um, so, uh, so generally, uh, if you want to be like precise about it, this would be like displacement uh, per second. Um, yeah, so, so that, that is the velocity vector. Uh, so if this velocity vector is applied to this object, then in, in one second, it's going to be here. Uh, in two seconds, it's going to be here, um, and so forth. So it moves along that vector. Uh, so that's one way of representing velocity. Okay, so another neat thing, or the, the, quite an important thing actually to remember whenever you're dealing with this, is to use uh, terminology that is kind of matching what you're talking about, because quite often uh, you're, it's easy to mix things up. Uh, so this is the velocity. Let's um, call it V equals that. Let's clarify a little more. Velocity. And then we have the magnitude of this vector. That is the speed. Uh, so the speed is the magnitude of the velocity. Um, so speed is generally something that is never negative. Uh, so it just it's just kind of a way of summarizing how quickly are you moving in the direction that you are moving in, right? Yeah, so, so velocity is a vector, speed is a scalar value, because it's the length of the velocity vector. Uh, cool. Okay, so both uh, velocity and speed are in meters per second. Uh, so generally that's a... So, so what this means is that on the x-axis we move one meter per second, on the y-axis we move two meters per second. Um, so at least in unity everything is in meters per second. Um, okay. Let's just draw a vector and another square. God damn it, Photoshop. Please cooperate with me. Here we go. So this is after one second. So it's also useful to talk about, because um, we use quite a, quite a lot of like terminology when it comes to physics. And sometimes it can be confusing to know which is which. Uh, so here's a useful, I don't know how to webcam. The, one way of presenting this or thinking about this is that the velocity, a little bit more formally, uh, usually we use the term delta. Uh, delta is just a fancy way of saying change over something, uh, or it basically just means change, but it sounds fancy, uh, so you like seem smart when you use that word. Um, so if we say delta position divided by um, delta time. So in other words, the change in position divided by the change of time equals the velocity. Okay. So what else? Uh, then we can have, then we can go one step further. So let's say not only are we changing position over time, but we are changing the velocity over time. Uh, so if you're thinking about a car, for instance, um, if you have some vehicle, that's a, what a vehicle, uh, and it's moving along some, some place, let's say we have uh, one meter, and here we got 
10 meters. Let's say it moves all the way here after one second. Um, okay, so if it moves all the way there after one second, um, oh geez, zero meters. That's not the color I picked. So if it moves 10 meters across one second, uh, then what that means, it moves 10 meters per second, right? Um, but we could we could buy, we could just rephrase this as well. Let's say it, it moves this distance over uh, two seconds. Then there's a very like simple way to remember how to calculate these different things. Uh, so remember how we measure uh, speed in meters per second, uh, or generally with cars, um, it's um, miles per hour if you use imperial units uh, or the wrong units, um, and then we have kilometers per hour if you use a slightly more correct units, but meters per second is, is cooler than both of these. Anyway, so these are all just speed, right? Um, but if you if you look at these, they're called kilometers per hour or meters per second, and you can literally type those values. We had 10 meters. Um, 10 divided by 2 is meters per second, right? Because this is 10 meters divided by 2 seconds um, equals 5 meters per second. Uh, so, so it's a very like neat, neat way where you can sort of shuffle the formula around very easily to kind of figure out what is the actual speed, right? Okay, uh, did that make sense so far? So we have change in position over change in time. That's exactly what we did here. Uh, change in position was 10 meters, right? This car went 10 meters. So that's the delta position. And then we have delta time, which is uh, two seconds. It took two seconds for this car to traverse the space of 10 meters. Um, and again, change in position divided by change in time is velocity. And velocity we got is five meters per second. Yeah, so so that's how you, how you sort of calculate speed now that you have all of these parameters, right? Um, okay, so let's say the car is, um, let's say the car is not moving at a constant velocity. So let's say that the velocity is changing over time. Um, then we get a different concept. So if we have um, the change in velocity over change in time gives us acceleration. So pretty much what we're talking about here is that the rate of change in position over time is velocity. The rate of change of velocity over time is acceleration. Uh, and both velocity and acceleration are vector quantities. Um, so acceleration is not just a single number. Velocity is not just a single number. Both of them are vectors. Um, if you want, you can keep doing this. Um, you can do the, the rate of change of the acceleration uh, over rate of change of time. Uh, but this usually you don't really go further than this. Um, it has silly names. I think this is called jerk. Uh, and then after that, you have heave or something. It's very silly. Uh, anyway, physics is strange. Um, okay. Um, so, so we have these vector quantities that can help us uh, know like how quickly this object is moving, where it's going to be after some amount of time, right? Okay, do you want an example of this? I think this is kind of like, it's easier to visualize this when you're actually writing code, and it might be a little esoteric to just look at these formulas. This is a car, just a, just a heads up. Okay, let's car, call it car, it's, it's a good name, straight up car. All right, um, let's let's make a very simple physics simulation. So we're gonna we're gonna give this a velocity. Uh, started um, we could use vector threes here actually. Void update. So here's another useful formula. I wonder if we should color code this. Okay, how's that? Is that better? Oh, acceleration, by the way. Um, generally, acceleration is in the very confusing um, unit of uh, meters per second squared. Isn't that kind of funky? 
I don't know how to write a small two without making it look like an S. That's wonky. Anyway, so essentially meters per second per second. Uh, okay, so now we're going to write a very simple simulation of this. Um, so the um, if we have um, a, a very useful tool or a very simple formula that's incredibly useful when doing stuff like this um, is that there's a... I already mentioned, Jerk. Wow. Are you not listening to the course? Jesus Christ. So if you want to know, let's say you start at some point and you have some velocity vector, some velocity v, and you want to run this simulation for some sort of time, right? Like you want to run it for five seconds, 10 seconds, however many seconds, right? Um, so one way to get what's called a displacement uh, displacement it just, is just a fancy way of saying position. It's kind of like a deviation from the starting point, uh, where after one second you're here, uh, after two seconds you're here, and so forth. This is called a displacement, but we might as well call it position. It doesn't matter too much in this case. Um, all right, so how do we how do we get this displacement given some time? It's a very, very simple formula. Uh, it is basically displacement or position. Let's just call it position. It's easier that way. Uh, position equals the velocity multiplied by time. There you go. That's it. Um, very simple. Um, and you can, you can sort of like shuffle these around if you want to like fig calculate other things, if you know some of them but not the other or whatever. Um, so this is um, it's it's very similar to the sort of the 2D version where or the one dimensional version where you have uh, distance. So now here's the one dimensional version rather than the vector based version. Uh, distance equals speed multiplied by time. Uh, so these are equivalent. It's just that this is the one dimensional uh, special case of it, uh, whereas this is the vector based version. So so you can use this uh, if you say, for instance. Let's say we, we know that a car went uh, 10 meters uh, over a crashed Photoshop document. Right. Let's say a car went uh, 10 meter and it took the car uh, five seconds or whatever. It, it could take any, any amount of seconds, uh, 20 seconds. Uh, then we can use this formula to calculate how quickly it went, right? If we divide both sides by T, we get um, distance over um, over time equals speed. Uh, so now we can figure out how quickly was this moving. Uh, and the same thing goes for if we had any of the other two things. Um, if we had, uh, you know, distance and speed, we can figure out um, the, the time it took. If we have distance uh, or if we have speed and time, we can figure out how far it went. Um, so it's, it's a very useful formula just to like solve those simple cases of you have some speed, you have some distance, and you want to figure out some time, or you have the time, or and so forth. Uh, useful to to convert between things. Let's do a little let's do a little mark around this. This is a useful bit of information. Both of these are useful. All right. So given this. If we go back to Unity, if we have a velocity vector and we want to move this object over time, how do we do that? Well, uh, in update, we can set the position of this object based on the velocity and based on the current time that has passed. So time.time .time gives us the current time in seconds. Uh, so let's see, we can do uh, position equals time.time .time multiplied by velocity. And then we do transform dot position. Actually, let's just let's just assign this directly. There you go. Um, now we're setting the position to the time multiplied by velocity. This is the exact same formula uh, that we have here, where velocity multiplied by time, or velocity multiplied by time. All right. So let's go back to Unity, and that's not public. Okay. So it is now set to one on the X axis. Um, so now it should move one meter per second on the X axis, right? So let's hit play. So now it can count. Seems like it's one second uh, per meter, right? Uh, and if we change this to negative one, 
uh, it's going to move in the other direction by the same amount, by one meter per second. And we set this to um, something lower, like 0.1. Uh, it's now going to move uh, 10 centimeters per second, or 0.1 of a, sorry, 0.1 of a meter per second. Uh, we can do this on the y-axis too. We can do 0.1 there. Now it's going to move diagonally because the, the vector is pointing diagonally up. Um, yeah, and this is just a constant velocity. Uh, this is kind of, it's just floating in space. It's just moving like this, right? Okay, now you might have noticed something. Uh, if I change these, uh, it's going to just change position immediately. We're not actually changing. We don't have a persistent um, position that we're modifying every frame. Uh, so usually this is not how you do it. Uh, this is more common if you like animate something where the time is known. Um, but quite often you move something per frame. Um, and on a per frame basis, uh, rather than setting the absolute position. Usually we use relative positions when we're dealing with discrete physics. So let's convert this to something where we're using discrete physics. Um, okay, so instead of transform.position equals, we need to figure out how much do we add to this one. Um, so if we just do transform.position plus equals velocity, so like we can try to think about what are we actually saying here. Update runs once per frame. So what this means is that we are going to move a velocity distance across a single frame. Um, this is not correct. If our velocity is set to meters per second, uh, this is not used as meters per second. This is meters per frame. Um, so we need to fix this, right? Generally, this is bad. If you have a very high frame rate, it's going to move fast. If you have a low frame rate, it's going to move slowly. Now we just yeet it away to infinity because it's moving, again, one meter per frame. And we are currently running this game at 8,000 frames per second. So that is too much. Uh, we want this to move a little bit slower. Um, so in order to convert this velocity to going from a per frame basis to a per second basis, um, or rather it's it's the other way around. We're converting this from velocity uh, per second or displacement per second uh, to displacement per frame. And we can do that by multiplying by uh, time dot delta time. Uh, time dot delta time is the uh, duration between the frames. Um, so by multiplying by that, we're squishing down this velocity uh, to be way smaller um, and then adapt to our frame rates because time dot delta time changes with frame rates. Uh, so now we've changed this um, from a uh, per, per second velocity to a per frame velocity. So now let's try this again and hit play. There we go. That looks more calm. So even though we are now at 8,000 FPS, it's still moving uh, one meter per second. Uh, and now we change these values, it's going to be relative to its current location. So we set it to zero, it's going to stop. Uh, we can do negative one on the y-axis, zero, uh, two on the z-axis, uh, and so forth. So now we're basically setting this velocity vector um, to uh, some value. Okay, so now we have a very, very simple linear movement. There's no gravity here or anything, it's just simple velocity. Hmm, trying to figure out what else we should do. Um, we could also do acceleration if we want to. All right, so in this case, we have velocity start. Multiplying by time dot delta time instantly turns it into meters per second again. It's sort of the other way around. Uh, you convert it from meters per second into meters per frame uh, because we're adding this per frame, right? Uh, so if we're adding a um, if we're adding a per second value, but we run it once per frame, it's going to be way too fast. Uh, if update was run once per second, uh, we wouldn't need this because then velocity would actually match. Uh, but then it would only update once per second, right? So we need to reduce this value uh, to a velocity that is in um, meters per frame. So we can we can be explicit about it. Um, there we 
There we go. Now this one is in meters per frame. Because meters per frame is much smaller than meters per second. Uh, all right, so in this case, let's do a, um, let's set the initial velocity and then velocity is going to be calculated uh, based off of the acceleration. So let's see, let's do an awake. In awake, we do velocity equals uh, velocity start. And if you're reading math papers and whatnot, uh, velocity start, usually it's called V0. Um, or like P0 if it's position zero and stuff like that. So um, so, so quite often you're going to see it as V0. That's the, the initial velocity. Uh, and then velocity here is not going to be simulated. Uh, so this is the current velocity. And then we also set the acceleration manually. All right. Uh, so we now want to modify the velocity. So now we want to do velocity plus equals acceleration times time dot delta time. Okay. So we are now converting this uh, from being a meters per second per second to a uh, meters per second per frame. And then we apply that, that to the velocity. And then in, in, once we have the velocity here, which is in meters per second, um, then we convert the meters per second into meters per frame. And then we move the position based off of that. So now we're modifying the velocity as well based off of the acceleration value. Uh, so if we go back to Unity, uh, let's set an initial uh, start velocity to 8 and, uh, no, maybe not 8, 5, 8. There we go. No, 4, 8. 3, 8. Okay, so if we just hit play now, um, it should just go diagonally up with no acceleration at all. This is a linear velocity, right? It just goes off into space. But now, Let's give it some acceleration. So let's set the Y acceleration to negative one and hit play. Uh, that's a little bit slow. So let's do negative 10. Actually, are we using acceleration? Yes. So now you can see that it did a little jump and then it started falling down. So what we're doing now is that we're essentially simulating gravity uh, by using this acceleration value. Let's set it to negative five so it doesn't drop as quickly. So it flies up and then it changes velocity and now it's flying down instead. Um, so what we're doing now is that we're essentially creating um, our own physics object. Uh, this is how the physics works in general. Um, instead of acceleration, we could also use, literally use physics.gravity. Uh, and this is the gravity vector of, of Unity. Um, is this still a car? Yes. Um, so let's ignore the acceleration and just use the gravity. Let's recompile, hit play, and it's falling. So now this one matches the, the physics settings in Unity. So if you were to put a physics object next to this and give it the same velocity, it would have the exact same animation. Um, yeah, OK. So that's sort of the, the very, very basics of um, rigid body motion. All right. So there, there are a bunch of ways that we can calculate this, um, like these types of trajectories analytically if we want. Uh, I don't know if I have time to go through them because it's getting very late and I shouldn't be doing this for too long. But yeah, we pretty much have, we could do trajectories. We could talk about, we haven't talked a whole lot about making oscillation and repeating patterns and easing. Those two are kind of useful. Uh, also, rotations, actually. We're going to talk about rotations. And uh, there are a few things about rotations that we haven't covered that is really, really useful. OK, this is going to be a bit of a mixed bag of thoughts and opinions on rotations. Rotations, cool. So previously, whenever we've talked about rotations, we've been talking about it in terms of uh, how rotations are represented in matrices, uh, where you kind of store the um, you store the basis vectors of, uh, of a coordinate system. And the way that those basis vectors are oriented uh, tells you the rotation of an object. And that's how the rotation is stored internally uh, for all the transforms in Unity. Um, they're stored by keeping track of these vectors. Um, but the way that rotations are applied is generally using quaternions. Um, so whew, let's see. Uh, the 
Generally, quaternions are kind of complicated to go into. Um, they're also sometimes called rotors, depending on how you represent the data and how you use them. And mathematically, they're pretty much equivalent, but quaternions are the most popular ones. Um, but, all right, but then we also have Euler angles. So Euler angles is kind of a relatively easy way to like interface with rotations by like specifying angles and degrees on, on each axis. Uh, so Euler angles sort of work by, um, you kind of specify the rotation around the each of these axes separately. So first you specify the uh, x-axis rotation, uh, and then you specify the um, y-axis rotation, and then finally the z-axis rotation, as in around the z-axis. There you go. So with Euler angles, you kind of give each of these a degree for how much you want to rotate around uh, those vectors. Um, so you would have... Um, you know, I don't know, it could be 90 degrees here, uh, it could be uh, zero degrees up here, and it could be some other degrees here. So yeah, so that's Euler angles. Uh, Euler angles are um, generally not super great uh, because they kind of suffer from a problem called gimbal locking, and they're also not good for interpolating um, states of rotation. Um, so, so generally Euler angles are mostly used for display purposes. Uh, like in Unity, uh, you have Euler angles up here for specifying the rotations of objects. Um, so if I increase rotation on the x-axis, you can see that it's rotating around the x-axis. Um, okay, so, so Euler angles is kind of just three values representing a single uh, rotation. Uh, so in this case it was 90, 90, zero um, and zero. Okay, so so Euler angles are generally bad. They suffer from a problem called gimbal locking, um, where after you do the first rotation, um, you can sort of make it so that axes align with each other uh, in a way that makes rotation the following rotations ineffective. Uh, and you can actually get into a state where uh, where you think modifying some of these values should work, but it doesn't. Um, so that's that's gimbal locking. Um, and it's bad. We don't want to have that. So we tend to use other ways of representing um, rotations. Um, so, but in general, the way that I think about rotations in my head is exactly using these basis vectors. Um, like these vectors exist in my head. I don't care about angles. Uh, angles are not a thing. Uh, but the the direction that um, these are pointing. Whenever I'm doing rotation math in my head, this is what I'm visualizing. Um, like, wh what? How do these look? Am I rotating around the red axis, uh, or am I rotating around the y axis, or the, the z axis? Uh, like, having this in your head is really, really useful uh, for this type of stuff. Um, okay, so, uh, but then again, whenever we think about these types of things, remember how we have orientation, not rotation. Well, they're sort of the same thing. Um, it's kind of like position versus vector. Um, okay, so, so remember that whenever we talked about positions, they were always relative to the origin of the world, right? Uh, like we, we can't really define them in any other way um, because you have the X coordinate of it and you have the, the Y coordinate of some position. Uh, so they're always relative to uh, some point in the world. Um, same thing goes for angles. When we measure angles, they always have to be relative to something. Usually it's the x-axis of the world that it's relative to if you're doing 2D rotations, um, and so forth. The same thing goes for rotations. Um, when you are talking about rotations or orientations, uh, there's a default orientation of the world. Uh, in this case, unity is y up. Um, so if you consider these two, uh, this is a zero rotation. Uh, nothing has happened. They're the same rotation. This is world space. No rotation has been applied. But if you start rotating one of them, uh, if you compare these two, uh, what this rotation represents is the difference between the default and uh, where this one is pointing now. Um, yeah, so that's the rotation that this one has applied. Um, so... Um, and there is another way of thinking about rotations, which is pretty useful, and also a way of crashing your Photoshop document again. So, quite, so, so whenever we talk about this now, remember that rotations is always considered as something that is relative to uh, no rotation or no orientation, right? 
Um, so it's, a, it's essentially a deviation from zero, right? Just like positions are a deviation from the origin of the world, uh, rotations are a deviation from this orientation, uh, which can sometimes help you visualize this. Um, okay. Um, let's see. So, the, so we have Euler angles. We can think about how the matrix has their basis vectors set up. Um, and another useful way of applying relative rotations, because um, this is usually how I think about absolute rotations, uh, but then you can think about relative rotations, rotations as in you want to add a rotation to something else. Uh, then there's a really useful um, shortcut you can use. Um, even Unity's Quaternion class has a way to apply rotations using this, um, and that is called the angle axis model. So angle axis is really useful when thinking about relative rotations. Um, like, let's say you have uh, some objects. Um, so you have some rotation on this, um, or some orientation of this object. And you want to apply a rotation. You want to take this object, but you want to rotate it around a very specific axis. Let's say you want to rotate it around this axis. Um, then there is a function in, in Unity's Quaternion class where you basically give it an axis, uh, so you pass this vector into it, and then you give it an angle, as in a floating point value, uh, for how, many, like how much you want to rotate it around this white axis right here. Uh, so this is a really, really useful shortcut. Uh, if you want to do something like, you know, I want to rotate this object or this vector around the y-axis. Uh, so then you pass the y-axis into there, and you pass the amount you want to rotate over there. Um, in some cases, you can actually you can use angle axis to represent the full rotation. Um, so usually it's a little bit esoteric in the way that it's stored, uh, because then generally the vector itself is the axis if it's normalized, but the length of the vector uh, is usually the angle. This is a little bit of a weird way of representing angles, but you can do it if you want to. Um, so, so this is the angle axis representation, but you can also use the unity quaternion dot angle axis in order to create a quaternion that does this type of rotation. Um, as for the angle axis itself, where the direction represents an axis that it's rotating around, and the angle around which it rotates, or the angle it rotates with, um, is it represented by the length of this vector, in Unity, as far as I know, this is mostly used for angular velocity. Um, so if you have a, uh, let's say you have a cube. There we go. What a cube. Let's say it's uh, rotating in this direction. Uh, then the angle axis representation of this is going to be a vector pointing out from this surface. Uh, and the faster this is spinning, the longer the angle axis vector is going to be, because the length of this one uh, represents the speed at which it spins. Uh, this is how angular velocity is represented in Unity. So if you have any rotating objects in Unity, uh, you get a vector that is pointing in the axis that it's spinning around. Um, and the length of that vector is the speed at which it's spinning um, in radians per second. So this could be degrees per second, it could be turns per second, uh, but for 3D in Unity, it's radians per second. Um, but if you're using 2D physics, it's degrees per second because because nothing is consistent, everything's garbage. Yeah, so so the, the angle axis representation is used for angular velocity, um, but you can also use this as an intermediate format to do manipulation of things. Um, yeah. Um, okay. This arrow is not very relevant. Okay. So, so pretty much the, um, it says, this is usually called a pseudo vector, um, because the, the length of this one encodes like some other data, which is in and of itself kind of strange. Um, so where the length just contains the angle because we said it does, right? But something that's kind of neat about using angular velocity like this is you can actually add angular velocity vectors to each other, just straight up vector addition, and you're going to get the actual rotation or the final angular velocity by summing angular velocity vectors on top of each other, which is really cool. All right, let's see. I think I have one more thing about rotations, uh, which is sort of off topic from this, but it's probably good to talk about. Let's do a coordinate system. Sorry if I'm rushing things a little bit, but it's getting very late.
and I don't want to go like too far over time. Let's say you have your, your x and your y axis in a coordinate system and you have a vector. Here we go. Um, okay, let's say you have a vector in your coordinate system. Let's call it v. So we talked a lot about rotations and how you can rotate things. Like you, you can use angle axis to apply a rotation to a vector. Uh, generally, that would be like you multiply the quaternion by the vector, and then you get a vector out of it that's rotated by that quaternion. Um, but it's, it's a kind of an expensive operation to do. So sometimes you can take shortcuts that are really neat. If you have a vector v, uh, and you want to rotate this 90 degrees, like specifically you want to rotate it to get a perpendicular vector of the exact same length, uh, but you want it to be perpendicular to your original vector. I don't know what to call this one, W. So there's a neat little shortcut that you can do in order to like rotate something by 90 degrees. Um, so if you want to rotate something by 90 degrees, you can do W equals it's going to be a little bit of a grab bag of weird, loosely connected ideas of rotation. <laughs> so uh, W equals negative V dot Y and V dot X. So if you swap the sides of the components, you, you flip X and Y, and then you negate one of them, you rotate it by 90 degrees. Uh, so yeah, that's how you get W there. This is an extremely cheap way, especially in 2D. You're going to be doing this a lot. Uh, like if you have the, um, if this was the tangent of a surface and you want to know the normal of the surface, uh, you just do this and then you get the, the normal of the surface um, because it's always 90 degrees off, right? Um, if you put the negative sign on the other side, uh, it's going to be a clockwise rotation instead. Uh, so then you would get this vector. Um, so it kind of depends on like what direction you want to go, um, but yeah. Um, so that's a neat little way of like rotating a uh, vector 90 degrees. 90 degrees. There we go. Um, okay. This is also in my math library. I have a bunch of extension methods. You can just do vector dot rotate 90 degrees or rotate uh, 90 degrees counterclockwise, rotate counterclockwise, and so forth. So it's a very cheap way of rotating things. Uh, are you rotating by setting the vector position? Uh, in this case, uh, it's we're, yeah, we're just setting directly the coordinates of this one, where this is the x-coordinate, this is the y-coordinate of this vector. Um, it's kind of like typing new vector2 before this parentheses. Um, let's see. Oh, here's a neat little side note. Um, so if you want to rotate a vector by an arbitrary angle, uh, it's kind of neat how um, if you say have a point and you want to rotate it by this angle alpha, so in other words, you want this vector to be able to rotate up to become um, somewhere here, right? Although in the middle of this text probably. Yeah, so if we want to rotate this point around the origin, um, then we would want to get this point out of this. Uh, kind of a neat little thing that you can use to to rotate a point is that if you look at these two vectors, um, these kind of form basis vectors for a coordinate system. Like, remember when we talked about matrices, um, about how uh, we have local space that is defined by basis vectors, right? Um, and then we can use these basis vectors to transform things between world space and local space uh, and so forth. Um, here are the matrices, there we go. So. Remember how we stored the rotation here uh, and the position and the fucky coordinates here? This rotation, we can actually do that uh, just for simple operations too, where if we want to rotate a vector, then what we can do with these two vectors is that we can put those in a tiny two by two matrix um, where we would have uh, v dot x, uh, v dot y, and then w dot x and w dot y. So now we have a two by two matrix and we can use this matrix to essentially transform this point uh, from the local space of this matrix to world space. Cause that is essentially what we're doing. When we want to rotate this uh, up there, we are transforming this as if this was in local space of this space um, into world space. Um, so this is the same thing as multiplying this uh, by our vector. I don't know what we call it. Let's call it P for point. Point dot X, point dot Y. 
And out of this, we get the rotated point. Uh, so let's call this P, and this is Q. There we go. So then we get a new vector, uh, Q. I don't know if this exists in Unity, um, but yeah. Isn't v dot x supposed to be before the negative v dot y? No, this is intentionally flipping x and y and then negating uh, one of them. That's how you rotate a vector by 90 degrees. Um, but if you want to rotate by an arbitrary amount, uh, you can sort of construct this space right here. Uh, and if you want to construct this space, um, remember that we talked about... Oh, geez, there's a lot of things on this chart now. Um, oh, here. Remember how we talked about how you can go from an angle to a vector uh, using sine and cosine, as in if we have the angle alpha, we can get this direction v. Um, so what this means is that if we want to rotate a vector by an arbitrary amount, uh, we can actually do, um, we can use sine and cosine to create this matrix. Um, we use sine and cosine to figure out this vector. And then we flip the vector using these to get the other axis. And now we have a rotation matrix that would then multiply by a point, which gives us a rotated version of that point Q, uh, which is, which is kind of cool. Uh, so if you want to write a function for this, um, I'm just going to look it up because I want to make sure that I get the signs right. There you go. Okay. So if we want to rotate this, uh, you can sort of work out the math here. Um, but essentially, you would first calculate the cosine. Um, let's call it C uh, equals uh, cosine of alpha. That's the, the angle we want to rotate this uh, with. And then we have S. That's going to be the sine of alpha. And then when we want to do this, uh, all the math up here, um, it kind of simplifies to something, something pretty straightforward. Uh, so what we get is return. So for the X coordinate, start with that. Um, that would be C multiplied by v dot x. It's going to look confusing because dot and multiply is the same thing. So the cosine by v dot x, uh, and then we subtract the sine of uh, v dot y, or the, the sine value multiplied by v dot y. Uh, and then we do the uh, sine with w dot x or wait w no hold on uh we just have v now v is the vector we want to rotate this is not the same thing as this oh god i made things confusing shit change color quickly you saw nothing why does it not okay there we go we're back on track um okay so we do the sign uh the sign value uh, multiplied by uh, v dot x uh, and then we add the cosine value by v dot y. Sorry, this took a while. Um, there we go. That's how you rotate a vector. Uh, that's kind of it. Um, you give it a vector v and then you give it an angle and then you can just do this math and now you can rotate a vector by an arbitrary amount. Um, so what this essentially is doing is that it's doing this vector math up here. You might be able to tell that this sort of has an analogy to the dot product. If you if you think of the uh, the cosine and the sine functions here, these form a vector. And if you think of this as a vector, this is a dot product between the direction we get and v dot x and v dot y. Um, so if we construct a direction from this, then it's essentially the dot product of the um, that direction and the vector v. And if we look here, the value we get here is the determinant, right? But the determinant is the same thing as rotating uh, the vector by 90 degrees and then doing the dot product. And the way that we rotate a vector by 90 degrees is by swapping the components and negating one of them, which is exactly what we're doing here. We have negated one of them and we're swapping the components. Um, so, so essentially, we're doing the determinant and we're doing the dot product. And given that, we then we have then done an arbitrary rotation by doing a very simple two by two rotation matrix and kind of inlining it into a single function. Um, anyway, you don't have to memorize this. I just wanted to mention it because I, I think it's kind of cool uh, that you can like relatively simply uh, set something like this up. It's called rotate in my math library, and it's an extension method of vector. Uh, so, so in this case, it would be um, uh, v dot 
rotate. And then you pass in the, the angle you want to rotate by in radians. Um, okay. How does this work in 3D space? Uh, it doesn't. This is a 2D rotation specifically. If you want to do a 3D rotation, uh, then a single angle is not enough. Uh, for that, you need a full quaternion representation of the rotation, right? Uh, and if you want to do that, you can either use quaternion.angleaxis um, or you can use quaternion.lookrotation and then multiply that by the vector. So this is like a specifically a 2D thing. But the but even if you had if you had this matrix three by three, you could do the same thing with a, a 3D vector. Uh, this is just a 2D case written out. All right, there's a bunch of things that not too much. There was only like easing functions and a few other things that we might have we could have gone through. But it's getting very late, um, and I should probably let y'all go. Any questions before we're done? And again, I'm sorry, I kind of rushed it toward the end. Things took longer than I thought they would. Um, so, so I'm really sorry that I didn't get enough time to do everything. How quaternions work. I can't go into the details about how quaternions work internally. Um, it's too much. Um, otherwise, the like 99% of cases when you're going to use quaternions, this is what you're going to do. You're going to use quaternion.angleaxis, uh, where you provide some angle you want to rotate around, like 90 degrees around, um, I don't know, vector3.up, or some other thing. Um, this creates a rotation that applies this. Okay, so quaternion, um, look rotation. This is the one where you give it a forward vector, and then, like, optionally, an up vector. Uh, so maybe this you give it a transform dot forward and then some some up vector here. That's another rotation. Uh, so usually, personally, I usually use this for relative rotations, <clears throat> and I use this for absolute rotations. Um, so if I want to apply a rotation to something, I usually use quaternion dot angle axis. Uh, if I'm going to set the rotation of something, I usually use look rotation because that's kind of easier to calculate in general. Um, yeah. Will you go over basic inverse kinematics at some point? No, because it's too late. This is the last lecture, so there's not going to be any more me. Uh, I'm over. It's, it's I, I'm going to end um, <laughs> because of because of how these things work. But anyway, so this is generally how I use quaternions. Um, and then if you want to apply a relative rotation, uh, so let's say we have, uh, let's see, this is a. Um, a rotation we want to apply to something, and then we have an actual rotation of something. So if we want to apply a rotation, uh, you use multiply. So uh, it's it's kind of like by convention because how qu how quaternions work. But if you multiply, uh, that is sort of the same thing as uh, adding a rotation to another rotation. Um, yeah, I think usually the added one comes before the uh, the absolute one, I forget. Usually you flip these around until it works. Uh, <laughs> so, <clears throat> uh, yeah, so, so basically, um, if you want to add rotation to each other, you multiply them. Uh, the order matters of these two. If you flip these two, uh, the rotations are going to be applied in the other uh, order. Uh, so the order matters a lot when you're doing rotations. Um, and yeah, if you want to subtract a rotation, uh, you're going to have to calculate the inverse of a rotation, um, which uh, quaternion dot inverse. There you go. So if you want to invert something, or if you want to subtract this rather than add, you would have to calculate the inverse rotation. Um, so you can do inverse rotation multiplied by rotation. So this is kind of let's subtract. Um, and this is sort of adding a rotation. That was a very quick crash course in rotations, <laughs> which is usually, usually a pretty complicated concept. Um, but generally, yeah, you would, you would use these. Uh, I almost never use anything but these functions. These, these are the, the core ones I use. Um, and again, you don't have to know how quaternions work internally. Uh, you can kind of just, um, as long as you know, sort of how angles, how you can think about angles, um, in terms of like, you can use the angle axis to apply a rotation around a specific axis and so forth. Um, Another thing that you need to be careful about is what space all of these are in, because quaternions are also relative to their parent space, right? Uh, so that's also a something you need to watch out for. Oh, 
Um, I have considered putting together an online math book, uh, which would essentially be a searchable online summary of all of this course uh, with all of the visuals and details uh, that would sort of act like a reference guide. Um, so this has been sort of something I've been like considering doing for a long time, but I've never really gotten started with it. Um, so uh, I don't know, it might happen at some point. Um, so maybe I'll do the very, very pre-alpha version of it in the document that we have. I can like add some notes about the dot product or whatever. Anything, oh, like if you want to say what you get confused about and tell which parts are confusing. Yeah, maybe. Do it in Unity that works in browsers. I don't want to do it in Unity. I want it to be, I want you to be able to go there on your phone and I want it to be easily searchable, like keyword search. And I want everything to work on all platforms. Um, but it, it would like, my idea is probably going to be animated GIFs next to text and try to also include some snippets of code to make things a bit more tangible. Um, so it's essentially a, a book of math uh, from the perspective of a game developer, where I would include uh, examples from, from games. Okay. All right. Um, bye, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for, for having me on to do uh, math. Hope it was neat. Uh, I just figured I should go through the assignments that I gave out. Uh, we have the, um, yeah, assignment nine and 10. Well, let's just, let's do both of them immediately. Uh, the first one was to draw a coil. <clears throat> so, or it's spring, whatever you want to call it. So the goal is to draw this coil and you need to be able to set the number of turns as in how many full turn will this make around the, the center axis. And then you set the height of this one. So you can set, specify the height separate from the number of turns and set the radius. Uh, so that's, that's it. That was the first one. Uh, so let's, let's do that. Let's make a C sharp script called coil. There we go. And we're just going to do this in Androgismas. Okay. Uh, so the first thing we uh, need to do is just like jam all the parameters in there because the, why not? So int, um, so turn count, uh, defaults to, I don't know, four, uh, float radius, um, which could be one, and float height, and set that to six. There we go. That's a weird number. Do I like that? No. Let's do four. <clears throat> uh, oh, right. All of these need to be uh, serialized. And there we go. So now we can set all of those. Uh, all right. Uh, so now we want to do, now we want to get the points between which we're going to draw lines. Um, because essentially, the way we draw things in Andra Gizmos is generally using a uh, set of points. And then we connect those sets of points uh, with lines, right? Uh, or we use a draw line function that takes uh, more than, you know, that, that takes points as input, right? Uh, so essentially what this problem boils down to is how do we get these points? That's the, that's the thing we need to solve. Um, and there are different ways of doing this. Uh, we could um, like, because there is the question of like how dense should these points be? Should it be one here, one here, one here? Or should it be like twice as dense compared to that or even more? Um, so the way that I like to specify the density of these points um, is to uh, make a constant and that could be something like uh, points per uh, turn. Because we want the, and we probably want this to be based on um, the, the turning of the coil uh, rather than um, something like, you know, a fixed number for the whole thing and so forth, right? Um, so yeah, let's do the 32 points per turn. Actually, let's do more. Why not? I have a new GPU, so we can, we can push it to 64. There we go. Yes, this is C sharp. Let's see if I can remember how the way that I set this up last time, because I had like a really nice way that I did this. I, I forget what I iterated over. Um, Okay, so we need to first off know the number of total points, right? Uh, we have the points per turn and we have turn count. Uh, so if we want to get the, the total number of points that we're going to make, uh, then we can multiply these together. Uh, so uh, let's make a point count, uh, which is going to be uh, turn count 
uh, multiplied by points per turn. All right, and then we need to set up an array of all of the vertices that we're gonna, uh, or, or all of the points that we're gonna draw lines between. So let's call that points, and that's gonna be a new vector three point count. Okay, cool. And then we iterate through all of these points. So first off, we need to, um, so we need to generate these points, and then once we're done, uh, we can use handles dot draw a a polyline which you pass in a vector three array, and then it draws a connected line through all of those points. Um, so, so this is pretty much all we need to do. Um, this is where all the magic happens, right? Here's where we need to figure out everything. Um, okay, so now we need to think about uh, how do we determine the position of all of these points? So we have, um, where is Photoshop? Do we have Photoshop? There's Photoshop. Okay, so there's one value here that goes all the way up here. So this is the height value. So as we're drawing this coil, uh, the, the Y coordinate is increasing linearly uh, across all the points, right? Uh, there isn't anything like uh, there isn't anything more to the height coordinate. Like that coordinate is only increasing linearly all the way up to the top. Um, and that's purely based on the height value. Uh, so one way we, we can do this is first imagine that um, because we're making a for loop that is now iterating through all the points that we're going through, right? Uh, but we might need to, it might be useful to have a value representing the um, fraction of which we progressed through this coil, right? Um, so usually uh, I call that value t. So it's some sort of interpolator. Um, I Sometimes people call it time, but that doesn't really apply in this case. Uh, but it's a value from 0 to 1. Um, okay, so if we can get a t value out of this, we can then uh, multiply that by height, and all of a sudden we now have uh, the y coordinate for, for this coil. Uh, or a z coordinate. It's probably easier to put put the z axis along this one. Um, okay, so how do we get the t value? Well, it's increasing from zero all the way to one throughout this for loop. Um, so uh, let's call this uh, t height. And the way we do this is we take the current uh, point index and then divide it by uh, the number of points minus one. Uh, we've got to make sure that this is a float so that we do a floating point division. Uh, so now this is a value that's going to increase all the way, uh, go from zero and then increase all the way to one uh, throughout this whole thing. Uh, so if we want to get the current height, um, or a point height, then uh, we can take the t value and multiply it by the total height. And th that's kind of it. Now we have that coordinate. Uh, now that one is going to increase from zero all the way up to the height value we've defined up here. Um, so that's kind of the easy part. So so that one is pretty much done. Uh, but then we get to the slightly more difficult thing of how do we know the angle that we now need in order to start coiling around this thing? Um, so kind of the key to figuring that out um, is to sort of turn the um, kind of figure out like how many turns are we doing for the whole thing and then how do we compress that down to um, you know what length along this whole thing is a single turn and then we can um, compress that down to repeat a value that is going to represent the number of turns. Uh, so if we want to do that then we need another t value that's not for the height but rather it's for the um, winding right so let's call that t winding. Okay, so t height is the progress uh, through the whole thing, right? But all we need to do is we can take t height and multiply it by turn count. Uh, so now, because we we have a value from zero to one, then we multiply it by turn count. This one is going to go from zero to one. Um, this value is 0 to 1, but if we multiply it by turn count, it's going to go from 0 to the number of turns we have. So if we have like 8 turns, it's going to go from uh, 0 to 8 throughout this whole thing. 
um, but we can then use this t winding value as uh, as a turn, as in the angular unit of turn, where zero to one is a full turn. So if we multiply height or t height by turn count, we're going to get four or eight full turns, or whatever we have set as a value here. Um, so obviously we need to convert this to an angle, uh, but that, we can do that relatively straightforwardly because this is a um, this is essentially an angle in turns. Um, so all we need to do for that is, um, so we can do float angle in radians is t winding multiplied by uh, tau, which I still don't have my math library here. So let's add my math library. I'm doing it now. Um, come on. What are you doing, Explorer? Uh, all right, so uh, now we have the angle in radians. If we take this t winding value and multiply it by uh, tau, so um, so now we have the angle in radians, and then we can use this in order to go from an angle to a vector, right? Uh, so let's get that. So this is going to be uh, actually let's make a vector three. Um, so uh, this is going to be the final point. So we do point equals uh, math angle to direction and then we pass the angle and radians in there uh, and then finally we need to set the z-coordinate of this one or we could swizzle this if we want to go along some other axis but this time I'm going to go on the z-axis uh, so I'm going to do point dot z equals the point height here right uh, so let's assign that over there and this should be that should be it uh, oh, we need to assign this point as well. So uh, points i equals point. There we go. So now it's in the array. Um, uh, all right. So uh, if we go back to Unity, recompile, we now have a coil. Uh, so we can change the height, and it's going to compress and stretch. Uh, we can change the. We cannot change the radius because I didn't factor that in. Um, so we could multiply radius here uh, on the uh, angle to direction one, because this is the 2D vector. Um, so now we can change the radius, and we can change the number of turns. We can set them to negative values and get some errors, uh, which is great. OK, cool. That was the, the first part, the first assignment. Um, is everything, is everything clear? Any questions about this coil boy? Kind of want to turn this one. Can you switch between clockwise and anti-clockwise? Uh, right now, no. Uh, but if you want to do that, uh, you could, um, where you set the turns of T winding, you could negate this value. Um, just slap in a negation and it's going to turn the other direction. Uh, all right. Is that VS Code? No, nope, this is Writer. Um, why does it have to be Radiance? Um, generally, I use Radiance everywhere because Radiance are are like good for all the functions everywhere because most things use Radiance. Uh, degrees are usually something that is mostly like user facing stuff in like UI and whatnot. Uh, but pretty much all mathematical functions turn out to be easier if you use radians. Um, so the angle to direction, for instance, takes radians because the um, the sine and cosine functions take radians, right? Um, so that's um, yeah. Uh, how does t winding work? Uh, so t winding multiplies the um, the current progress along the coil multiplied by the number of turns. Um, so t winding is going to go from uh, zero to the number of turns, um, and now that we have that value that is smoothly increasing from zero to the full number of turns, um, we can just multiply that by tau in order to convert that to radians, because we already have a value representing how much it should wind for any given point in this uh, in this coil, right? Um, yeah, that was the first part. Uh, the second part. Uh, was to add a start and an end color. This is relatively straightforward. Uh, so public color <clears throat> color start. E. And color end. 
the the only tricky thing about this one is that you kind of have to do the line drawing yourself because draw a polyline doesn't allow you to like <clears throat> to make a gradient across the whole thing. Um, so in that case, we would have to draw the points ourselves, which we can do. Um, we would need to make a for loop for loop across all the points. So points dot length minus one, um, and then we can do draw line from um, points i to points i plus one. There we go. And then we want to set the color here because now we can set the color per line that we're drawing. Uh, so we kind of want a t value again. We sort of want this t height value. Um, so we can just slap that in again. Um, so let's just call it t this time and let's get a, get our color. Um, actually, we can just do handles dot color equals um, a color lerp. So color dot lerp is going to interpolate between two colors based on a value between zero and one. We talked about lerp before uh, linear interpolation. Uh, so we're going to blend between um, color start and color end based on t. All right, then we probably want to reset the color afterwards because probably good to do that. Um, Okay, we now have two colors and they're both white, so this is not very exciting. There we go. So now we have kind of hard to see on stream, I imagine. Oh, I can't rotate it. Rip. Um, but yeah, it's now got two colors. Um, you could set the width, but Unity's line drawing doesn't look very good. Um, yeah, we need to make an, or would that work? Maybe. Actually, it's in pixels, right? They become like fuzzy and gross and I don't like them. Um, I would rather use use shapes to do this. <laughs> I guess it's more visible on stream, so why not? Um, okay. Uh, so that's the color. Uh, we can actually ignore the color after this um, because the next assignment doesn't really have anything to do with color. Um, so I'm probably I'm just going to go back to the previous one where we draw on the points. Let's keep the thickness. Okay, the next part is that we are going to generate a uh, torus shaped coil. Uh, so now the goal is to make this shape. Uh, my drawing is not super accurate and great, but hopefully the idea gets gets across, right? Uh, we want this coil to go around a circle. Um, so instead of height, it's now going to be a circumference. Um, okay. So first off, I think I want to. I like splitting things up into functions uh, sometimes for stuff like this. Uh, so um, let's make a um, let's make a function where we pass in the t height value. Uh, and then we get the coordinate out of that. Um, so let's make a function called, um, let's make a static because that's going to be neat. Um, static vector three, uh, get uh, coil point, or actually get linear coil point. Um, so what do we need in this one? We need float t, float total height, and float radius. And uh, then I want to be able to toggle between these two. Um, so let's make a a bool for whether or not it should be shaped like a torus. All right, so we get the t value here. And then essentially what I want to do is um, if points i or if torus then we want to use one function, otherwise we want to use the other one, right? Um, so get linear coil point, uh, we pass the t height value and the height of the coil and the radius of the coil. All right, and then we need another one. Uh, we need the, the torus point, so I guess for now we can just copy that. Uh, so height is going to be circumference for the, for the torus, right? 
Uh, and the radius is going to be the minor radius, not the major radius. Uh, if you have a torus, uh, then the, the, the what the radius is is kind of ambiguous. Uh, so usually if you have a torus, you differentiate between the mi major radius and the minor radius. Uh, so this would be the um, major radius, um, whereas this would be the minor radius. Uh, so basically the radius of the coiling on the outside here. Um, so this would be the minor. Okay, um, so we're going to call that, uh, we're going to call this uh, minor radius. And this is not going to be the linear one. So this one is going to be the torus coil, coil point. Uh, all right, cool. So it doesn't work right now. So we need to, uh, actually, let's do, let's just add the function here first. Um, so first the t value progress along the whole thing. It might be good to rename this to just t at this point. And then we get the circumference, which is height in this case. We're kind of hijacking that uh, value. Uh, minor radius is just going to be a radius. Cool. All right, so now we're just going to move this into the function. So all of this handles the branching and all of that now, so we can focus on the math, right? Um, okay, so for the linear one, um, we are pretty much done if we just... Uh, oh, we need the number of turns, right? Um, Okay. Okay, maybe I should turn this into an if statement. <laughs> um, it looks a little messy to have that on a one-liner. Um, okay. There we go. So the linear one done. Um, I guess one thing that would be good is to just make sure that it works for now. Because I might have messed something up. I don't know. Uh, it looks like it still works. Neat. All right. So now we want to generate this coil around the torus. Um, and now we need to like be careful about, um, now we need to really think about what is it that we're getting, what are each coordinate that we're calculating out of this and so forth. Um, so I think that the first thing to think about is when we changed the t value for the linear one, uh, we were moving along this whole thing, right? Zero is the start and one is the end of this coil. Now, if we make a torus, then we kind of have the same thing. Uh, we start with zero and then we go around this one. We get to 0 0.5 and then we get all the way back around to one. But this time it's circular, right? But but the same same idea holds. Uh, we want to generate points along this circle. Um, so instead of this increasing linearly, uh, just in a straight line, uh, we want this to increase along a circle. Uh, so a good starting point is to get the center point on this circle, like on the blue um, on the blue line going through the torus, right? Uh, so that would be a good good starting point. Um, so um, how do we get that? Well, the uh, just like we did before, we had this method of getting an, converting from an angle to a direction. Um, so we can do that again. Um, so so now we have the t value for the sort of the percentage around the whole thing, um, and we can just multiply that by tau to get the angle in radians um, around the whole thing, right? Uh, so. Um, so T multiplied by uh, tau gives us the angle in radians um, of the the angle to the center point along this whole thing, right? As we traverse all the points. Um, okay, but we want this as a vector. We don't want this as an angle. Uh, so we want to use um, angle to direction. Cool. So, so now we have a direction vector that is pointing to the edge here, uh, but we don't really just want a uh, direction. We want this to be a position uh, all the way over here, uh, because the radius of this whole thing could be different. The radius could be huge, it could be small, um, but if we just get a direction, the direction is going to have a length of one, but we want this direction to have the um, 
to represent the to, to also have the length of the radius of the torus, right? Uh, so we don't know the radius of the torus. Um, so we need that. We need to multiply that by the major radius. Um, but we don't have the major radius. Um, but we can calculate that. So, um, so if you remember when we talked about circles, uh, the uh, the circumference equals the um, the radius times tau. Um, so given that we have this formula, we can just um, we can just do this, right? Uh, we take the radius, or we can just like sh shuffle this around a little bit. So if we have the circumference equals radius times tau, uh, if we divide both sides by tau, we get the radius, right? Because tau will cancel out on this side, and on this side we just get divided by tau. Uh, so now we can use this to calculate the um, uh, to calculate the radius, right? Uh, okay, so um, float major radius equals uh, circumference divided by tau. And for those of you tuning in now, tau is 2 pi. It's just a different name for pi multiplied by 2. So if you don't have tau in your math library, you can do uh, 2 times pi. I just personally don't like pi. I have a grudge against against pi, so tau just makes everything easier. Um, okay, so now I have the major radius, as in the radius going all the way from the center to the edge of this torus. And now we can multiply this direction vector by that uh, major radius. Uh, so if we multiply the major radius here, we now get a vector out of that, which is the center um, the center point inside of the torus, right? I'm not sure what to call it. Um, core point? I don't know. Um, so now we have, like what we are calculating now is the, the point going along this circle. Uh, given a value between 0 to 1, we are going to get a point along this whole thing. That's it. That's all we have right now. Um, okay. Um, so pretty much what we have now, if we look at the linear coil, coil point, uh, we pretty much did this part right now. Uh, the, the sort of the, the coordinate that is traversing uh, as the percentage is going from uh, 0 to 1, right? or 0 to 100%, I guess, if we're talking about percentage. Um, OK, so core point is essentially that value that is going around the center. But we still haven't done the actual coiling, right? Um, so now we need to start getting into some, some coordinates, right? Uh, because if we want to coil around this one, uh, well, then we pretty much have uh, the issue of we need to figure out the coordinate system, right? Uh, so if we are making this whole coil thing, uh, then we need to make a system where um, we have coordinates pointing to the center of the torus. Let's make an axis like this. Um, actually, maybe not. Maybe that's not the best one. Hold on. Let me let me orient myself. Um, Okay, so we want this to be a coordinate system that is aligned with the uh, center of the torus. And then we need a y coordinate, or a y basis vector, or whatever you want to call it, uh, that is going like this. Um, so we need to sort of construct this coordinate system, because this is the, the plane in which uh, we want to generate uh, the coil uh, coordinates in, right? Like this plane right here. Um, and we, we don't really have these vectors, so we need to calculate them. Uh, but then as soon as we have these vectors, uh, we can start getting points in this coordinate system, right? Based on some angle. And that's what we want to do. Uh, so, so the first thing we need to do is construct that coordinate system. Um, and if we look at the... We already have the vector going all the way to here. Um, so if we want to get this red axis, the x-axis of this coordinate system, all we need to do really is just take the this coordinate and normalize it, and then we have the x-axis, right? Um, so we can we can set up the uh, local x or x local. Um, that's going to be the core point dot normalized. And that's kind of it. 
uh, then we need the y coordinate and we can just axiomatically set that to something. Um, so um, I think the way that we've done this right now is that our coordinate system, if you think about the coordinate system of the torus itself, I think we have Z in um, Photoshop, please. I think Z is going in this direction. Um, and then you have the, the X axis and the Y axis would go toward the camera. Um, so so the, the other direction here, the green one, uh, that would be the Z axis here. Uh, so we can probably just do, um, let's see, that's going to be the, the Y local. It's going to be uh, vector three dot forward because that's the Z axis, right? Okay, so now we have the two axes. Uh, now we have uh, the green one and the red one. Uh, so that's our X and Y axes for the plane in which we're going to start rotating a local space point, right? Um, okay, but we need that local space point first. We need uh, basically the equivalent we had here where we got a winding value and then we converted that to radians and then we got an angle or a direction based on that winding. It's the exact same thing here. Uh, so we can we can literally just take this code, um, we can paste it and um, multiply by the minor radius. So winding is T multiplied by turn count. It's the same thing there. The winding works exactly the same. Um, Cool. The difference is that uh, this point is now in local space. So we need to kind of convert it to world space. Um, there are different ways of doing this. We can we can set up a matrix if we want to, uh, or we can kind of do the matrix math um, ourselves. Um, so what we can do is we can take the um, take these vectors and multiply them by the components of this local space point. Uh, let's call it local point, um, and then add the core point. So uh, if we do vector three, let's call this um, uh, or maybe just maybe just return the whole thing actually. So core points, everything is, should be relative to uh, the center point right here, right? So that's core point. Um, so now we're adding the vector pointing to that center. Uh, cool. And then we need to, uh, the, the thing we're doing now is we're getting a vector in this plane of the x and the y axis here. Um, so we need to take the x coordinate, multiply by the x axis, take the y coordinate, multiply by the y coordinate or y axis. Uh, so core point, that's all done. <clears throat> then we take the local space point, x coordinate, multiplied by x local, uh, plus uh, local point dot y, multiplied by the y local direction. Um, and then I do believe core point should be a vector three. There we go. <clears throat> um, okay. Uh, I think that's it. I don't think there's anything else to it. Um, unless I missed something. Let's see if this works. Switch to Taurus. Um, and that does seem to work. Uh, let's see, we can change the height, which changes the circumference. Uh, we've changed the number of turns. And now we have our torus coil. We can change the radius and all the things we wanted to change. And yeah. Kind of looks familiar to the dot product. It's sort of the, um, it does look, look familiar, look similar, but, but yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of it. Um, that's. That's how you do the, the coil thing. Any questions about that or thoughts or whatever? It's pleasant to see all the parameters being laid down one by one instead of trying to play golf. Oh, gotcha. What if you don't normalize the local X? Um, then what's gonna happen is that um, it's gonna stretch because the, uh, depending on the radius of this thing, it's gonna stretch along that one. How did you manage to divide the turns with loop seamlessly? Um, I just have turn count set to an integer value. Um, so as long as that's an integer, it's going to loop seamlessly. We didn't use local Z at all, right? Um, 
Well, it depends on what you mean by local Z. Uh, the, the point in the um, winding of the spiral itself doesn't need a local Z coordinate. Um, that's not required. Uh, but once we convert it to world space, um, then we actually do something along the Z axis. Uh, because the, the Y direction here is actually the world space uh, Z axis. Um, so then we do go, go into the Z axis here. Right. I'm just gonna make everything relative to the game object, so we don't, um, so we can like rotate it and position it elsewhere using drawing scope. Drawing scope is neat. There we go. All right. Um, yeah, guess that's it. So kind of the kind of the tricky part of this assignment is to figure out how to do this um <clears throat> and the like realization that progress around this whole thing is the same thing as progress along the height of the, the linear one because uh, that makes everything kind of way more easy um <clears throat> but it's still the the trickiness of like thinking in terms of these vectors and using like local space coordinates and convert them to like world space coordinates and whatnot so that was kind of the core of this assignment. Um, can you also draw the core point? Um, I could. Uh, the only tricky part about that is that um, don't know if it's easy to do that because we don't have that information outside here and the drawing happens afterwards. Um, but the, the core point is basically this part right there. And I guess we could do that separately. We could just do um, if Taurus handles dot draw wire uh, disk, and then we need the, the center, which is uh, vector 3.0, uh, the normal, which is vector 3.4 uh, forward, and the radius, which is um, height divided by tau, right? There we go. Oh, the next assignment turned out to be more evil than I thought. Um, I didn't intend it to be as difficult as it as it actually was because um, there was one thing that I sort of forgot when I was writing the assignment, um, and that is that um, it kind of requires you to um, know some trigonometric functions that we didn't talk about or some trigonometric laws. Um, so, like the given what we gone through, it turned out to be way more difficult than it should have been. Um, so. Yeah, but that's okay. We're we're all we're all learning. Uh, it's fine. All right. Uh, the next assignment was to recreate the budget cuts inventory. Uh, if you're not f not familiar with budget cuts, um, it's a it's a first person stealth uh, VR game. Um, budget cuts inventory. I don't know if someone took a screenshot of it. Um, doo -doo -doo. So basically, thanks for linking the image, Google. Um, so you have this bubble attached to your hand. So it's a VR game where you're holding controllers in VR space. Um, so those controllers are visible in game as well. Um, and the way that the inventory works is that the, the inventory has this bubble. And when you put items in the bubble, they're going to be arranged in an arc in front of the controller. Um, and so so all of these objects are automatically arranged uh, based on how many items you have and the radius of each of these items. Um, so that turns into a mathematical problem. So what, what this is basically is that we have a um, we have some sort of arc radius or um, it's kind of the, the distance away from the controller. So we're going to consider this to be the bubble. Uh, where there was this like plus symbol um, and uh, then items are arranged in in front of you so you would have items uh, sitting in each of these bubbles or sitting in each of these slots uh, so the goal of this one is that 
or at least the first one, is that you should, uh, given an arc radius and an item radius, uh, your goal is to uh, arrange items next to each other um, with these circles touching, like they should be really snug. Um, and you should be able to set it to any item count. Um, and that's kind of it. Um, that that's, that's all you need to do there. Okay, so this one turned out to be more difficult than I wanted it to be, because as soon as you go to where you can set a different radius for each item, uh, it actually gets more complicated. Uh, so we're going to get into that. And the last thing is to orient items based on um, the orientation of all of these bubbles. Uh, but anyway, um, okay, so this is the assignment. Let's, let's jump into it. All right, inventory, doing everything in Androgismas. Um, okay, I want everything to be relative to the this transform as well. So, um, what? Okay, cool. I guess we, we just need the parameters first, right? Well, we have the arc radius, we have the item count, and the item radius. Uh, so item radius, I guess, should be something low. Uh, we need the arc radius. Uh, something higher, 0.5. Um, actually, that's pretty big. Um, And item count. Hmm, okay. I'm trying to figure out if we should do the advanced thing immediately or if I should show you how things go wrong. I think it's better to show how things go wrong. So um, let's just first draw this so that we can see what's going on. Um, so the first thing we should do is um, we should draw the, uh, the arc and yeah, ju let's just draw the arc. So we can use handles dot draw uh, wire arc. Um, then we have a center point, which is just going to be zero. Uh, normal, let's put that on the z axis. So vector three dot forward. Uh, and the from, um, I guess for it's probably easiest to use the, the x axis as our starting direction. Um, and then angle in degrees, um, I guess 45. And radius. So radius is going to be um, arc radius. So this is going to draw half of the arc. I just want to draw the other half uh, because we want this to be centered around a specific point. Um, so this is just for drawing the arc. We got an arc. All right, well, step one done. Um, okay, so now we want to draw these items. Um, so we can do handle star draw wire uh, disk. Um, then we have a position. Uh, so now the question is, what should the position be? For now, I guess we can just um, draw a dummy one. So position at uh, vector three dot right multiplied by arc radius. Um, normal is vector three dot forward, and radius would be item radius. There we go. So now we should draw a single one in the center here. Okay. <clears throat> um, so now we can change the uh, arc radius if we want to. Uh, we can change the item radius and so forth. Um, okay, so now we want to add the item count. Um, so now we already have a math problem, right? Um, we have a math problem where we want to place a number of items here, but the question is how far apart should they be, right? Uh, like how far do we separate them? 
Um, and there are like there are different ways of approaching this. Um, there's some more complicated ways and some less complicated ways. Um, I don't know if any of you did this assignment. I don't know which approach you used, um, but where's my pen? There we go. But one way you can do this that is actually not fully correct, but it's approximate and it's generally close enough. Well, there are kind of two approaches to this. Either you actually let's do this one. So if you consider the radius here, this is the item radius. Uh, we can form a right angle triangle with this one right here. Um, assuming I can draw. Uh, and this, um, if these are tangent, which they are, uh, this is a 90 degree angle. I know it doesn't look like one, but let's pretend this is a 90 degree angle. Um, so, so now we have the, um, we have the item radius and we have the arc radius, right? Yeah. So, so given that, uh, we can actually figure out what this angle here is. Um, so let's, uh, let's give that a name. Alpha. Okay, so we talked a lot about the uh, triangle solving stuff in trigonometry, where you have this set of formulas, uh, where if you have a right angle triangle, which we do, uh, we can use these formulas to figure out um, one of the angles based off of uh, two sides which is exactly what we want to do. Um, so, so consider what we have now. Uh, in our case, we, um, we have the opposite and we have the um, hypotenuse, right? Um, because the right angle is here. So then the radius is the hypotenuse um, and the uh, item radius would be the opposite. Okay. Uh, so we have the opposite and the hypotenuse. Um, so if we look here, opposite and the hypotenuse would be the sine function. Um, so sine of alpha equals uh, the opposite over the hypotenuse, uh, which we can rearrange so that we get this formula down here, um, where the angle equals the arc sine of opposite divided by the hypotenuse. And this is what we need. Um, so let's let's steal that and just let's move it here so we can have it in context. All right, so it's going to be a little different this time. So um, the alpha in this case is the uh, this one right here. There we go. So a sine of opposite divided by hypo hypotenuse. The opposite is the item radius. Uh, and then we have the arc radius is the hypotenuse. Um, I don't know what we should call this. Uh, Let's call it R, controversially. These are two different things because they're, they're, they have different colors. So that's that's pretty much all we need to do then. Uh, so then we can figure out the angle. Um, so now that we, we can then get that angle, if we multiply that by two, we get the full angle here and then we can get the separation uh, between these objects, right? Okay, cool. Um, so float item separation angle in radians. Um, so this is math dot um, arc sine of the um, item radius divided by arc radius. That only worked if both objects have the same item radius though? Yes. We're going to get to that. That's later in the assignments. Uh, item radius divided by the arc radius. So now that we have the uh, separation angle, we can draw all of these circles, right? So we're going to make a for loop and we're going to iterate over all three items or however many items we have. Um, and then we're going to draw a disk for each of those. Now, instead of vector 3.right, uh, we need to get a vector from the angle. Um, so we can go back to using the, the function we've been using a lot, the um, angle to direction function. Um, so we need some angle here and then we'll multiply that by arc radius and that's going to give us the uh the offset or the, the local offset for where we want to draw this disc right um or i guess item center would be a better name for this so item center 
Uh, okay, so then the question is, what is this angle? Uh, well, we're going to start out by uh, doing item separation angle multiplied by i. Uh, so um, let's say ang red equals i multiplied by separation angle. And then we pass that into the angle to direction. And then we draw the wire disk. Um, there we go. Recompile. <clears throat> Uh, all right, so we're, we're almost done. So the separation angle is now half of this, right? But we wanted it to be twice as big. So multiply that by two. And there we go. Okay. Um, so now they're not centered though. So that is something that we also want to do. We want to make sure that these um, get kind of like shifted so that they are uh, in the center instead of like offsetting to the side. Um, so then in order to do that, we need um, we need to get the um, angular span of all of these divided by two, right? Okay, so how do we get the angular offset? Well, uh, so angular offset uh, would be item separation angle uh, multiplied by item count minus one, uh, because we there's only um, the item separation. We only have two levels of separation here, right? Um, so we all, always want to subtract by one, because there's always one less separation angle than there are items, right? Um, so then we have the offset there. Oh wait, and then we also need to divide this by two, right? Or multiply by 0.5, because one half of that's that full span. Uh, yeah, and then we can subtract that from the angle to direction, uh, or subtract that, that here from this angle. Uh, right. I think that should work. I think I got that right. Uh, looks correct. Okay, so if we set item count to one, two, three, four, five, seems to work. We can also have more items than fit on this circle. Great. <clears throat> uh, we can change the, the radius and everything is going to adapt for, to that. Okay. Neat. Yeah, so that's kind of the that's kind of the first step in this one. So now we've solved the um, first one, but not the other one. So so let's let's now get to the more complicated one. <laughs> All right. So so the thing we want to do now uh, now we want to be able to set a per it item radius, right? Um, I think did I have? Uh, that's fine, I guess. Um, <clears throat> Okay, let's make a class. Um, let's call it item. Um, should be serializable. And then we want to have a... Actually, all we need is a set of radii, right? An array of radiuses for each item. So float array item radii. So the number of, of radiuses or radii that we have is also going to determine the item count. Um, so let's default to uh, three items with a radius of the same thing we had here. Uh, I think that's good. Uh, all right, so now we need to change a few things, right? Because now um, all of this works a little bit differently. We can't presume all of them have the same radius. Um, so now what we need to do is we need to go through all of these one by one and then offset all the following one based on the current radius, right? Uh, so, so okay, things are going to get a little bit more complicated now. Um, let's, for now, just ignore the offset of centering. We can do the centering like much, 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 much later. Uh, all right, so instead of item count, uh, we're now going to go through all the item radii. I guess we can make a variable for this if we want to. Uh, so that's uh, item radii dot length. So now we have item count. Um, okay, so the angle now should be based on the previous uh, the previous uh, the previous item, right? So now we kind of need a an angle that we can increase over time. So let's do angle angle in radians uh, equals zero, um, and then we, we want to increase this for each item that we're going through. 
Um, okay, so we start with zero. Uh, we do the item center, uh, but then we want to offset this uh, based off of the. Um, we want to offset this based on how like the angular span of each of these individual items, right? Um, so, um, heck, I forget the. I had a, like a, I had like a really nice way of doing this before, but I don't think I remember exactly how I did it. But you know what? I can ignore that for now. Maybe we can clean it up later. Um, okay, so we have the angular, angular, angle and radians, and for every object that we go through, we then want to increase that angle by the the span that that ang that this object covers. And here's where things get a little complicated because we can't actually uh, just presume that the span of a single item is consistent because it actually depends on the next object, but we're going to take some shortcuts now. Um, so let's just multiply this by two for each individual items and, and their radii. Um, so, so previously we did this as a global thing, but now we're going to do this per item. Um, right, item radius in this case would be uh, item radii i. There we go. Could make a parameter out of this, or a variable. Um, Uh, okay, so radius, um, same thing here, use the same formula. Um, we get the, the separation angle. Uh, and then we want to add that to the, the angle that we're then going to use for the next one, right? So that we offset everything else following this one. Uh, okay, so let's try that. They're not going to be centered anymore, I'm ignoring that for now. Uh, okay, so now we have an array of item radii, and if I decrease this one, um, it's now going to shrink, and that does not work the way that it's supposed to. Um, oh yeah, wait, I need to add half of this, um, because now it's adding uh, twice of this one, but it should add um, half of the first one, and then half of the next item, because now it added too much here. Um, so... I think what we need to do is, um, let's see, before we calculate the item center, if i is greater than zero, because we only want to do this if it's not the um, not the first one. Um, let's see, let's call it, um, doo -doo -doo. Half separation, yes. And then, if we are the the, the first one, we don't want to offset this one at all. Uh, so we're going to ignore this on the first iteration. So only if i is greater than zero. But if it is, uh, we want to do angle and radians uh, plus equals um, the half separation of this one. Uh, and then we draw the item, do the item center, and everything. And then we offset by half of it again. Um, and this one we want to do always. So there we go. So now we should be adapting this uh, for all cases. I'm pretty sure. Uh, there we go. Okay. So now we can increase this one. And we can change the last one. Change the center one. And everything sort of seems to work. Um, okay. I want to change the size of this arc because it's painfully small. Okay, now things get a little bit more complicated because the way that we have calculated this so far is actually uh, incorrect. Um, the The problem is that if we increase the radius of, let's see, we make this one small, we make this one big. If you look here, you might have noticed that there's a gap. It actually doesn't fully align. So, okay, are we just, is, that's it, it's over. It's nothing we can do. It, it's bad, um, except we can apply the 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 log cosines will actually help us here. Um, so so what is actually going wrong? <sighs> I don't know if I, I'll be able to draw this uh, very well, uh, but the essentially this is a discrepancy between um, the angles toward the points that would be tangent to the center, the angles there, 
are not the same as the angles between where the circles are touching. If you consider this angle, those two angles are slightly different. Um, and the, the larger discrepancies you have between these circles, um, then the, the more this discrepancy is going to show up in forms of gaps uh, between these circles like this, right? Um, yeah, so, so that's a thing that, that we should solve. Um, okay, so now we need to rethink things a little bit. So the, the thing that we need to do now is that we need to know what is the angular span between uh, each of these items, right? Um, and they could have different radii. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be the same radius. Uh, so we need to know the angular span between these two and so forth. Oh, that was not all of them, I guess. Or was it? Oh yeah, there's a bug in Photoshop actually. Uh, so this is the, the problem that we have in front of us. We have um, circles of different radii, uh, and we need to figure out what is the angular span between these two. Um, so the answer to that is, let's see if I should make this one a little bit bigger. Okay, so now we have the, let's see, the center point of both of these. And we know the radius, right? Uh, the center of all of these items is going to lie on the arc, and we know the arc radius. Um, so the arc radius is the same for both of these items, right? Um, so we can, we can just draw those lines, and we know those. These are known values. Uh, so these are the arc uh, radii. Okay, what else do we know? Well, um, we do know that each of these have their own radius values, right? Um, and we know that these circles are touching, which means that the full length between these two is cleanly divided into the radius of this one plus the radius of this one. So using this, we know that these are two radius values that are kind of combined together, um, where we have, I guess let's just call them A and B. Um, we have A and we have B. Okay, so I think what would happen with a naive solution is that you would sort of do a right angle triangle on both of these two, and that's not correct um, because it's not actually centered. Uh, so, so here we have a math problem, right? Um, we have a triangle. Uh, we have all the sides of the triangle. Like we know the length of this side, we know the length of both of these sides, uh, but we don't know any angles. We, we don't have a single one. Um, usually when you do like right angle uh, triangles, uh, the reason those are pretty simple is because we know at least one angle. We know that this one is 90 degrees and that makes the problem easy to solve. Um, but in this case, we don't know any of the angles. We just know side lengths. Um, and here is where we get into the, the law of cosines. Um, so let's, the, let's go to the, the Wikipedia. Um, Wikipedia, law of cosines. That's not how you spell that. There we go. Uh, do, 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 do. Let's see if there's the the good tally of all the things. Maybe that wasn't here. Here we go. Okay, solution of triangle. This is a really good page on Wikipedia. Um, so you can sort of go through all the different, like, do you have two angles on one side? Do you have only three sides? And then given all of these things, um, you can then solve for, for the last one. Uh, we mostly talked about right angle triangles now. Um, so if you have three sides, that's when um, I just lost it. Um, that's when the law of cosines gets super, super useful. Um, so given a triangle where we have three sides, uh, we can use this formula right here. All right. Uh, let's see. So let's put that one next to the whole thing. All right. So given this, we can kind of just plug the numbers in, right? Um, we have uh, a plus B gives us this whole side, right? Um, and let's look at the triangle here. Uh, let's see, where do we consider? Um, I guess we can consider the alpha to be the, our own alpha, right? 
because that's the angle we want to know. Uh, so let's mark that as alpha. So let's write this formula out. Uh, so let's do uh, alpha equals uh, the arc cosine. So um, arc cosine of uh, okay, so now we have um, a squared plus c squared minus b squared. Um, so give, if we look at all of these, then we are looking at this angle down here. Uh, that's the angle we're interested in. Um, so a squared is the opposite side of this angle, right? Uh, if we look at the opposite side, that is um, a plus b squared. Um, so a plus, um, it's green, b, uh, and then squared, all right? Uh, and then plus c squared, um, oh wait, that's not an s, or no wait, did I do the wrong one? Yeah, I looked at the wrong one, sorry. Uh, let's see, this is at the end of this formula, so sorry. This is what we're subtracting in the end. Sorry, okay, so that's that's minus a squared. That's the end of this formula right here. I was looking at the wrong one. Um, okay, so the first thing is uh, b squared plus c squared. Uh, so b and c are both of the adjacent sides that we have here. Uh, so what essentially that means is that we have uh, r squared plus r squared. Um, because a and b are the same in, in our case. Sorry, uh, b and c are the same in our case. Um, so r squared plus r squared um, this is the same thing as 2r squared, right? Uh, so 2r squared. Okay, minus a squared, which is the opposite side squared. Uh, all right. So now we got the numerator done, now we just need the denominator. Uh, denominator is um, uh, 2bc, so 2 times r times r. Uh, so 2 times r times r is uh, 2r squared, so it's exactly the same thing here, 2r squared. Uh, and now if we do some algebra, we can simplify this a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so let's let's keep this formula around. So this is kind of the full version of it, um, but we can simplify this one because of we because of the fact that we have two r squared in both the denominator uh, and the numerator. Uh, we can simplify this to remove all of this. There we go. To one minus all of that, and that's it. Uh, because essentially. Um, we can split this up into having uh, 2r squared here minus this whole thing divided by uh, 2r squared. Um, and on this side, the bottom 2r squared is going to stay. On this side, they're both going to cancel out and they're just going to be 1, the value of 1, uh, because um, x divided by x equals 1, um, as long as x is, you know, not 0. Um, so, so given that, uh, that's how we get this 1, because it's 2r squared divided by 2r squared. So that's just 1. Uh, and that's it. So now we have the formula for getting that angle. Uh, Alright, so um, this kind of gets into like code structure stuff. Um, I personally kind of like to pre-process these things uh, so that I have all of these angles. Probably bad for like memory management and whatnot, but I don't care. Um, okay, so let's make a new array. Um, <clears throat> so let's call these um, angles between or something. So this is an array that contains all the angles between them. And the angles between are always going to be one less than the number of items. So we have one angle between here and another angle between here. Um, so we're going to do a new float array uh, and that's going to be item count minus one in terms of amount of uh, the number of values. <clears throat> and then we can calculate this. Let's do a for loop. Uh, so um, angles uh, between dot length. Uh, okay, 
Now we can just use the same values we had before. Uh, we have a radius a and radius b. Let's write them out. So we have a is um, the uh, radii. <clears throat> so we get item radii uh, i, and then the next one is is b, and that is item radii i plus one. So just the next radius over, right? Oh yeah, we could split them into uh, two right angle triangles. Uh, that's true. Uh, however, if you do that, you don't get the per um, per circle angle, so it depends on if you need that or not. We don't really need it in this case, so in this case it would work. Um, <clears throat> okay, so float a, b, and then... Um, so now we have the opposite side of the angle, and we already have the radius, and then we can pretty much just do this formula in order to calculate the... Um, to calculate the angle between them. Um, all right, so uh, float uh, angle equals math dot um, the arc cosine between, um, uh, let's see, the arc cosine of one minus um, a plus b squared. Okay, so a plus b, <clears throat> that is going to be the um, the combined radii, I guess. So a b length, I guess we can call it. Uh, so a plus b. Uh, so 1 minus a b length times a b length. So that's uh, a plus b squared. All right, and then we want to divide that by 2 times radius squared. Uh, so 2 times... Um, the arc radius times arc radius. There we go. Uh, and then we assign that to the angles between. Uh, Alright, uh, so now that we have all of this, now we can go to uh, where we were drawing all of this before. Um, instead of doing this um, adding before or after or whatever, uh, we can just add after, right? Uh, so we draw the first circle, and then we add the angles between of the uh, the current one. Um, yes, this one is going to be sad on the last iteration, so we want to make sure that this only happens uh, before the the last one. Uh, so if um, item count, or sorry, if i is uh, less than item count minus one. That's why we want to do this. Better to do for i equals one and then use item radii i minus one. I disagree. I don't like using, um, generally I don't like using different i values here because we are interested in those i values here. So there we go. The gap has been closed. Uh, that's sort of it. Um, yeah. If you had the power to erase from the universe a topic from math in its entirety, what would it be? Uh, pi. It's not really a topic, but top loop is still going to blow up. What do you mean? No, this is fine. Um, this one is one less than the number of item radii, and it's an item radii where we do i plus one. Rest is sort of the same, um, offset by half of the spans or whatever. I guess we can do that real quick. Uh, let's see, float, or I guess the, the angle here, I guess we would just do angles between dot sum and then divided by two. I think that would be the start angle, maybe negative that. There we go. Uh, this is technically not correct, but it's very close and we can pretend this is correct. Otherwise, I don't know what topic I would nuke for math. I guess they're all useful in their own ways. Um, yeah. Anyway, so that's how you would create this inventory. Yeah, the, the, the one thing that's not correct is that we're not taking into account the difference between the outer radii now. So if we want to make this actually centered, we would need to take those two outer radii into account, um, which is possible, but uh, okay. I think that's it. That's all of the, the math course.